Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for being here on the second day of the High Performance and Disruptive Computing Remote Sensing uh, Summer School. Uh, my name is Gabriele Cavallaro, and I'm with the Ulysses Computing Center. So today we have a second day. Yesterday was very productive, I would say, here. I want to show you again our website uh, with the agenda. Um, you see here, yesterday we have a very in interesting day. And we are already starting to upload the material. So if you go now here inside, for instance, the first day, you see that at each lecture you find, you know, get slides. So you can download actually the material from, from yesterday. Um, so here you find everything. And then uh, for the second day, we actually already uploaded the material of the next two lectures. And I'm actually very happy to introduce you, uh, yeah, Pablo Quezada Barriuso who is going to now uh, have a first session of the morning and talk about sensing computation applied to remote sensing hyperspectral preprocessing on shared memory system using OpenMP. So Pablo, I will now let you share the screen. I hope you can hear us. OK, yes, Gabriel, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to share the screen then. Mm. No. Okay. Can you see the presentation? I think because yeah, we can I'm, see. It. Okay. Let's. Uh, it's in a small time. Okay. <clears throat> so, well, hello, hello, everybody. Hello, and um, welcome to this summer school, and also welcome to this, in particular, to this session that I'm going to present today. I would like to thank the organizers of this summer school for inviting me and for organ organizing these kind of events. I really hope that you enjoy this session and all, obviously, all the sessions of the <clears throat> summer school. My name is Pablo, and I'm an assistant professor in the computer, computer and technology area of the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And I'm also with the Remote Sensing and High Performance Computing Group, led by Professor Dora Blanco at the Research Center in Intelligent Technology, also in the University of Santiago. In this group, we work mainly in the combining fields of remote sensing and high performance computing. We focus on achieve efficient solution, not only related to accuracy of the uh, application or, or the analysis, but also to execute a so focus on the execution time using different computing platforms, such as parallel architecture, uh, in particular, in my case, uh, shared memory system, um, such as a multi-core CPU, and accelerator like the uh, GPUs uh, shipped by NVIDIA. And sometimes, why not all at once? Multi-threading in CPU with multiple GPU. So there is a lot of fun in our group. This use case that I'm going to present today, named uh, Stencil Computation Applied to Remote Sensing Hyperspectral Preprocessing on Shared Memory System using OpenMP, is based on a work that I developed during my predoctoral stage uh, some years ago. And I really proud. Uh, to have been developed a part of this work during a research state at this university in Iceland. Therefore, I'm more than happy to be here today remotely, but I'm here today and participate in this summer school. I'm going, I will do a very short introduction with the hope of motivate you to use the parallel architecture. Yesterday, we have the opportunity to see uh, why we need high performance computing in the most sensing field. I'm going to highlight again this, uh, this topic, and I'm going to put today the focus on you. I will continue with an overview of parallel uh, computing theory and OpenMP for parallel programming of shared memory system. Just, uh, the minimum that we need to know to start to program uh, in a 
multiprocessor of shared memory. I will explain then the use case and how we implemented it to run in parallel, mainly using the same parallel pattern. This is the most interesting part of this uh, work that is named Wallet Based Classification of Hyperspectral Images Using Extended Morphological Profiles on Graphics Processing Unit. I'm going to present the OpenMP version today. Okay. And finally, uh, we will see some results and let's have time for questions. Okay. So let's start with uh, something that uh, we already commented, that is that in air observation techniques, uh, sensors on board satellites acquire data from air surface, say air surface every day. And the amount of data that is sent to data center to be stored and processed is increasing, increasing exponential, expo exponentially, sorry, exponentially, because we have more missions every every year, and we also have better sensor of higher resolution. For example, the satellite data archived at the German Air Observation Center stores data from different air observation missions, including the Sentinel satellite satellites of Europe's Copernicus program. This data acquisition is growing by 20 to 30 terabytes every day since uh, 2019. And the trends and forecasts for 10 years from now of the data volume to be acquired and stored only only in this work, data warehouse is about 200 of petabytes. This is, a this is a lot of data to process, a lot of data to process, only by an air observation center. Big data and deep learning application feed on this volume of data. So obviously people working in this field are more than happy if we only think in the information that can be retrieved from the sensor, we have a lot. But how much time are we willing to wait to get the result? If we use only single query processor, it would take a long time to get the result for sure. We must use emerging architecture to reduce the execution time. This is ever more important in applications that require real-time decision making. Today, it's no longer enough to wait for new, faster, single core processor, like uh, many years ago. That is over, that is totally over. The improvement in performance that we have obtained in, in this processor size 20 and three has been reduced to less than 5% per year, due a monoda factor to the limit on power dissipation. So today, we need parallel architecture from shared memory multiprocessor, such as those we have in the desktop computer to high performance computing cluster made up of hundreds of threads, hundreds of computes nodes, incorporating in addition accelerators of many cores such as a graphic processing unit. But that is not enough. We need people. This is the focus I want to give today. We need people programming for this architecture. And we also need technique for parallel programming because we can't be reinventing the wheel every time we write a parallel implementation of our sequential program. Why don't we search for similar code and give it a name? There is no need to be creative with every new piece of code we write for a parallel architecture. We need to be creative in finding the global solution. So let's do now a short introduction of to parallel computing on shared memory system. Watching this picture, a deep drawing. <clears throat> when you are a child <clears throat> and you learn to draw, you do it based on patterns that you combine to create objects with a meaning. For example, a house. And this pattern can be as simple as a square. <clears throat> I 
In this drawing of a yellow house made by a child, the windows are like a square, more or less. The door and structures of the house are rectangular. And the roof is triangular, triangular. The sun is a circle with stripes. And the clouds normally have three curves on the top, like in cloud computing, right? These patterns are not unique to a house, are just building blocks. And you can use them to create other drawings, a board, a truck, a dog, whatever you can imagine, all your family. You learn to use an adapt pattern to draw anything you can imagine. The more patterns you know, the more you use them, the more drawing you can make, and each time of better quality. Oops, sorry, I'm moving too fast. In writing code, <clears throat> we frequently find computing patterns that are common in many algorithms, like in life. For example, histograms that accumulate uh, the frequency of values in an input data of the input data, for example, in an image, vector addition <clears throat> to add element by, by one by one, matrix multiplication, <clears throat> partial differential equation that are used in, in physics for physical simulation, or convolution that adds a type of uh, computation where the output element need data close to the input element that I processing. There are also patterns related to the structure of the algorithm. For example, for solving the heat diffusion equation, we iterate several times until the system is stable. This is the computing pattern. Other patterns are related with the accesses to the data located in memory. I can read data in an array sequentially, for example, a multiple times, or using a step two by two, for example, only the even position. Or simply, I only need read data only once. <clears throat> in parallel programming, we also find computing patterns that are common in parallel algorithms. This pattern usually have a name that indicates the type of operation I must apply and how to implement it among the processing units. For example, the reduction operation or the stencil computation, to cite a few. The reduction accumulate values in a shared variable in a multiprocessor and it's used, for example, for histograms and the stencil computation access data within a window of a neighbor data, of a, de of a neighbor element. This last one, the stencil computation, is the name we use in high performance computing to name a convolution. So you probably know more patterns than you think. There are also patterns in parallel programming for accessing data in terms of read and write such as atomic operations, or pattern for distributing data among computing nodes. If you identify the main patterns in your algorithm, your parallel implementation will be easy to code. However, uh, parallel programming is still a challenge, OK? Um, <clears throat> it is a challenge because you need to write code that runs concurrently on a parallel architecture. Therefore. You also need to know the details of this architecture, such as the number of processors and the number of threads available to execute instructions simultaneously. How is the memory distributed between processors? Is the memory hierarchy shared among all the processors? There are a lot of details that you need to know about the architecture in order to make your program run efficiently. Even if you recognize the patterns, they are not implementing the same in a shared memory multiprocessor like a CPU or in a many core architecture like the GPU or in a high performance computing cluster with a distributed memory. 
That is why it is a challenge to start with parallel programming. The first difficulty <clears throat> is the application program interface. Uh, which language or which library or how do I write code to be executed in parallel? You can write, write parallel code using operating system functions directly to create processes and threads. And in this case, you have full control over the resources you use, but need a good knowledge yet of the operating system. You can also use libraries that help write programs to exploit the hardware of multi-core processors of shared memory in shared memory system. For example, the Intel 3D building blocks uh, is an example, or using OpenCL for uh, implementing code in CPU. Or in the case of a cluster of a distributed memory system, uh, you can use the MPI or the MISIS name misses passing interface. In the case of the accelerators, as a GPU, we also find several options for programming from the low level OpenGL interface that we can use on any GPU, so it is portable, to libraries of with a higher level of abstraction, such as the compute uh, unified device architecture for general purpose programming on GPUs. As you can see, we have started, started talking about software, the program interface, but I keep an eye, I must have the hardware present in mind. GPUs, shared memory, distributed memory. In the middle of all these libraries, we have OpenMP. OpenMP is the facto programming language for shared memory architectures, and it is very easy to use it is a very easy to use programming interface with directive, directive that tell the compiler which parts of my code I want to run in parallel. We will see it in more detail later, but for now, OpenMP, what we do with OpenMP is delegate part of the responsibility of the creation of thread and shared data among different units of processing to the compiler. We delegate that responsibility to the compiler. However, the ultimate responsibility for the program being correct remains yours. Remain yours. It is very easy to write parallel code with OpenMP if you are not worried about performance. So you need to be, uh, you need to give it a bit of effort to give, to get a, a good implementation writing OpenMP. The compiler does the the hard work, the hard work, but we need to use the uh, programming interface uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. In addition to the programming interface, you need to know the hardware specification to be able to exploit the resource the resources efficiently. In this use case, we are going to focus on shared memory multiprocessors. We talk about a shared memory multiprocessor when several threads have access to the same memory space, representing in these figures in this rectangle. Um, in this multiprocessor, the memory hierarchy is a key element to consider because it affects the performance of your program when reading and writing data from different threads to the same to the same memory address. The communication among threads is done in the backstage by reading and writing in this uh, main memory or in the shared memory space. So I do not need to explicitly write code to send data to one processor or to another processor. This is done automatically when I read and write data from this uh, shared memory. However, as each multi, as the processor, as each processor has its own private memory, that is a cage memory hierarchy to speed up or to reduce uh, the waiting time for executing distraction. When I move data from the shared memory 
to the private memory of the CPU, I can find some type of problem, but uh, it is interesting and less mentioned, so you are aware of this problem when you start to programming in the CPU. An example of a shared memory multiprocessor is uh, basically any system uh, that you can see in a personal computer, in a mobile, in a laptop, uh, with, for example, a two quad core CPU supporting simultaneous reading. That is the case of my computer that I'm using today. That have 16 threads available by hardware. So all the threads have the same have access to the same memory space. That is up to three, sorry, 32 gigabytes of memory. So any thread can read and write data at any location at any time on all the 32 gigabytes of memory available in the system. If you want to use a high performance computing cluster, the interconnection network between compute nodes is the key in this type of architecture. The main question or one of the main question is how do I send data to different processors? To ask when this question, I need to know a bit more about the function I have to distribute the data. You will learn more about this topic with Alvaro in the next use case. So in this session, as I commented, uh, we are going to focus on OpenMP and multi-core CPUs. Today, a shared memory system such as desktop computer also have one or more GPUs. So the available hardware is normally heterogeneous and to get the best result, and in order to get the best result, you need to know several program interfaces, not it's only enough with OpenMP. Or may not be only enough with OpenMP. You need to know one for the shared memory, another for the CPU, and another for the distributed system. So, as uh, I commenting, the difficulty increases the time you get more resources to be exploited in parallel. The third difficulty comes from the lack of theory uh, on parallel programming, basically. Parallel patterns are building blocks that guide our design in parallel programming. So this pattern can be found widely in different algorithms and are extensively studied when working in high-performance computing. To apply this pattern or this parallel pattern, it is necessary to split the problem into units that can run concurrently in different processing units, such as the cores of the CPU. We need to find the concurrency. This is uh, the difficulty. We have no theory or normally we start to program uh, using uh, any, any interface, OpenMP, uh, CUDA, whatever. I don't mind we start to program, but we don't take a while to study a base theory for parallel programming. And I think this is uh, very interesting to highlight this in this uh, use case uh, so uh, you are aware that parallel programming is not only about writing code. It's related to writing code, that's right. Also uh, related to the architecture and also related to a theory for to a theory for parallel programming. There are basically two kinds of parallelizing, lucky for us. Tax level parallelism and data level parallelism. From a task point of view, different parts of the algorithm can be separated and run in parallel. And from the point of view of the data, data can be distributed among different processors and the same operation is executed in parallel. These two kinds of parallelism sometimes depend on how you approach a problem or how you focus uh, your problem. In some algorithm, it is easy to create tasks and distribute them among the processors. And in other problems, it is, it is more natural to apply parallel at the data level. We can see here an example of, of how to find the, concur the concurrency 
in a uh, in a short piece of code. We can see in this example uh, the concurrency from the point of view of the task and from the point of view of the data. This code that is writing this code that is writing in C in C language implement a linear al algebra operation known as SACSP, that is single precision A multiplied by X plus Y. And it is a combination of a scalar multiplication and a vector addition. It takes as input two float arrays, X and Y. X and Y with the same number of elements and a scalar value. And this operation multiplies each element of the right X by the value and add the result to the vector Y. We can implement it in sequential uh, with a simple loop that iterate over all elements of the right and make the uh, computation. So from the point of view of the task, I have to perform n operation of the type x here x by i plus y. Therefore, I have n tasks available to be distributed distributed among the processors. From the point of view of the data, I have a, an array of n elements on which I'm going to apply the same operation. Therefore, I can divide the array into equal chunks and distribute them to each processor. As you can imagine, the parallel, the parallel implementation will probably be the same as we will see later in an example. But we started the analysis with different focuses. In addition to these three difficulties, program interface, hardware, and patterns, that we find in parallel programming, we need to add those that we find in our field of research. For example, in remote sensing, and, in, and particularly in the analysis of hyperspectral images, it is necessary to adapt the algorithms to process the spectral dimensionality offered by this type of image. This is to say, despite learning a programming API, Knowing the architecture details and understanding how to implement parallel patterns, in many cases, I need to rewrite them for the case of hyperspectral image. Basically, a, a, the hyperspectral image can be processed in the spectral domain or in the spatial domain. I have represented in these figures these two approaches uh, and how can we store the data in memory to process the image in the spectral domain or in the spatial domain? We talk about hyperspectral image processing in the spectral domain here. When the image is divided into multiple blocks made up of entire pixel vectors, and we assign each block to a different processor. Algorithms that do operation in the spectral domain, that, such as principal component analysis or signal compression by wavelets, will obtain a better performance if we process the hyperspectral image in the spectral domain and store the data in memory, as illustrated in this figure in the left, as a matrix of pixel vector. As we can see, each row is an entire pixel vector represented here with all the spectral band. And the matrix has the width and height of the image number of uh, rows. On the other hand, when processing the image in the spatial domain, each band is divided into chunks that can be assigned to different processors, as illustrated in this part of the figure. And in this case, we can store in memory each spectral band of the image as a two-dimensional array. So each spectral band is stored one after another. And algorithms that perform operation in the spatial domain, like segmentation, 
or mathematical morphology will obtain better performance if we process the image in the spatial domain. So basically, what you need to know here is that uh, to exploit the hardware that has a memory or a memory at hundreds of threads would be more interesting I store the image as a matrix of pixel vector if I'm going to do um, an spectral processing over the hyperspectral image or I store the image one band after another as a matrix of pixel individually and a collection of a spectral band if I'm going to do some um, spatial, spatial processing. So now that we are aware about the difficulties and that we know that um, there are a lot of work to do. I'm going to do a short introduction to the, the OpenMP. So um, OpenMP is the facto application program interface for parallel programming in C and C++ and Fortran or shared memory multiprocessor, okay? OpenMP philosophy is uh, to parallelize sequential code using compiler directive called Pragma and let the compiler generate the instruction needed to run the code over multiple thread. It is also it, ha it has also a set of functions to set up number of active thread or check thread or check if the thread are into a parallel region or for timing the execution time. But they are but they are only a few. The focus is on the Pragma directive that we will see now that tell the compiler how to distribute uh, your sequential code uh, over the different uh, thread or the different processing unit. The programming model and the programming interface therefore uh, are portable across compilers and architecture because uh, OpenMP is the specification of the of the program interface and the fabricants and the compiler uh, so the compiler will implement the specification of OpenMP. So if I write code using OpenMP and move from one architecture to another, I only need uh, a compiler supporting my version of, of OpenMP. Based, based on the type of parallel construction, oh no, sorry, I missed something here. So let me say, let me uh, comment uh, this figure. The OpenMP uh, interface uses a fork join model, model that is representing this figure. That is uh, when, a, when a thread, the master thread is uh, executing sequential code and find a pragma. It fork a team of thread and execute that region in parallel. And when the region ends, all the threads join to the master thread and continue the sequential execution. And again, if the master thread is find a new pragma indicating a new parallel region, it will create a new team of thread. Okay. Based on the type of parallel construction that I can define uh, different time of parallel construction, the work within the, this region is divided among the threads in the team. All the thread has access to the memory, to the same memory space that, uh, that's, uh, that is obvious, that we have in a shared memory system. Um, each thread has also a private memory space. They have their own, their own memory space. This private memory can be used to perform local operation to avoid, for example, a problem known as false, false sharing that appears when programming a multiprocessor that is related to the cache memory hierarchy. But uh, it is beyond the scope of this session. Keep the name, false sharing. You need Today, all you need to know is that parallel programming opening P is quite easy, but it's a challenge. Okay. In this fork join model, 
at the end of this parallel region, there is an implicit synchronization barrier. And all the threads are joining to the master thread. So any thread will not enter to a new parallel region until all the threads have end the last parallel region and reach the implicit synchronization. OpenMP support uh, different work sharing constructs to distribute tags across threads. Mm -hmm. The main constructs are for loops, section, and task. The last version of OpenMP also allows you to send work to a GPU. This is a new type of work sharing construct. So nowadays with OpenMP, you can program an heterogeneous uh, computer with a multiprocessor and GPUs. We can distribute the work among threads. Let's start by here, using sections. In this parallel word sharing construct, the distribution of word is done in a fixed way, assigning to each thread one of the sections within the parallel region. It is useful when I have a fixed number of tasks, regardless the size of my problem. However, it does not allow to scale the problem by introducing more processors and there is not enough work for all computing nodes. In the work sharing by task, that is uh, other work sharing constructs, a thread creates a pool of stack, a pool of tasks, and each thread will extract tasks from that cube, that cube while there is work to be done. It is especially recommended for recursive algorithms and solving load balancing problems uh, in, in the application. I'm going to I'm going to explain the for loop, that is the other word sharing construct, in a little more of detail as it is the parallel region type using, uh, in this use case, um, probably one of the uh, most used when programming OpenMP. In a for loop construction, the iteration of the loop are distributed among the different threads. We can indicate by means of option in the plasma directive how to distribute the iteration. We can do it statically, as in this example, and assign to each thread a consecutive block of iteration always in the same order. For example, the first thread executed the first block of extraction, the second thread, the second block of extraction, and so on, so on until assigning all the iteration. This is the same code as we saw uh, a few minutes ago. I did the SecP operation that we are that we can parallelize with only one directive the type of type uh, parallel for for loop and indicating that I want a distribute a distribution of the iteration among the strip in an started way. So we ask what is going to happen uh, in the back state is that the first two iterations will be assigning to the first thread. In this example, we use four thread, only four thread, okay? The first two iteration will be assigning to the first two thread, the second two iteration to the second thread, the four and five iteration to the third thread and so on. And that again, assign the same iteration in the same order. Okay, so this is how the static schedule share the iteration of a loop when using a directive for loop. If the workload is not evenly distributed among the iteration, that was the case of the SACP operation, we can use another type of scheduling to distribute the iteration because load imbalance problem, load imbalance uh, application uh, are a problem when uh, trying to uh, execute or exploit all the resources uh, in an efficient way. So the other options available are dynamic and guided. 
The difference from the static schedule is that the dynamic assigns the iteration to the thread, that is to the first thread that is prepared to execute them. So it does, it does not necessarily have to be the first block to the first thread, the second block to the second thread, etc. In the guided scheduler, the number of iterations assigned to each thread decrease in each assignment, starting with large block of uh, iteration to a small number of iteration. We can also specify the number of iteration we assign to each thread in the directive of the, of the pragma. And this division of the size of the problem is known as chunk size, chunk size. In the static or the dynamic scheduling, the chunk is the same for all thread. In this example, it's of size two. Each thread has two iteration of all the available uh, iteration in the loop. In the case of the guided scheduling, each read start with many iteration. For example, the thread number two was the first to be ready and get assigning uh, the first fourth iteration of the loop and the number decreased at each new assignment. You will see the first assignment here, all the threads have much iteration that in the second assignment of uh, of iteration of the loop. So to finish the introduction to OpenMP, we need to know the available mechanisms for synchronization. In a parallel architecture, we need tools to coordinate work between different processing units. In the case of OpenMP, between the thread of a team within a parallel region. Okay. The variable tools are the first one implicit synchronization at the, end, at the end of each region, at the end of each parallel region, when all the threads join the master thread. We can also synchronize threads explicitly using a specific OpenMP pragmas that allow to create, for example, a barrier that is a point to I introduce in the code where all the threads wait before continue their execution. So it is an, a specific synchronization. And there are also pragmas to allow to update a shared variable safely using an atomic operation. All synchronization mechanisms are important, especially to avoid another problem that we will encounter when programming in multiprocessor system using thread that is known as a race condition. A race condition occurs when two or more threads access the shared data and they try to change it at the same time, which generate incorrect result. So to summarize uh, this short introduction to OpenMP, we can create parallel program in a very simple way using a few directives of the compiler for the compiler. All threads have the same shared memory space, which allows data to be shared directly by simply writing the result to a memory position and reading from that uh, position. And we can find problems that affects performance. We mentioned only two, not so bad. Right? File sharing or obtain wrong result due to access to the shared memory space by every thread, that is a race condition. So now that we know something about the patterns and we see a, a few parallel construct in OpenMP, I'm going to focus in the stencil computation pattern and how to implement it in OpenMP. Okay. The stencil computation is a pattern that is often found in signal, image, and video processing, and it is widely used for solving different equation in physics simulation, for example, or implementing convolutional, convolutional neural network for artificial intelligence and computer graphics. 
it is also known as a convolution, as I mentioned. And the name of the tensile computation, computation is used in high performance computing to describe this pattern. <clears throat> and this is tensile computation, the main pattern that I use to create the spectral spatial classification scheme that we, we will see uh, in the use case. A convolution basically is a mathematical operation on two functions that express how the shape of the input data is modified by a filter. Each output value is generated as the weighted sum of the input element within the filter. Therefore, the output the output depends on the neighborhood, usually centered on the element on which we are applying the convolution. By moving the filters through each input element, we can process all the data. And convolution can be applied in one, two, or three dimensions. The filter is also known as kernel or a structural element and depend on the area of application. Formally speaking, the term of kernel defines the right of weight and gives the name to the convolution. For example, one dimensional convolution in signal processing or two dimensional convolution in image processing. But in high performance computing, in particular case for high performance computing, we use the term of kernel to define a block of code we are going to implement in parallel. So that term is already used, already coined. So sometimes we use uh, the, the term filter in a type of kernel. Okay, whatever uh, stencil computation is a mathematical operation on an input data uh, that use a filter, a kernel, or even give a different name, a structural element, if you are uh, doing a mathematical, ap applying mathematical morphology. This figure shows an example of a convolution in a dimension, one dimension. And in this example, the input data is represented in an array of five elements and the weight of the filter in an array of size three. That is the filter for the convolution has, has three elements and has a rectangular shape, okay? The value inside the boxes represent the values of the input array and the filter. They are not uh, <clears throat> in this position of the array, okay? Using a three <clears throat> element filter means that each output element in the output array is generated by the weighted sum of the input element at the corresponding position here, one position to the left and one position to the right. The figure shows the result of various output elements when the filter moves to the right, starting at the second position. From here to the, to the last position of the right. The sample also show the corresponding code in C language where the convolution is implementing with two for loops. The first loop iterates on every input element of the right, and the second loop perform, perform the convolution. So this loop move the filter through the input array, and this loop perform the convolution and generate the output value. We can observe in this pattern the following. We need additional data. You probably notice it. We need additional data when we use the filter in the first and the last element of the array. We cannot modify the input data because each region, each iteration, sorry, at each iteration when calculating the output element, we need neighboring data that must be the original input data. And the number of operations increase with the size of the filter. So the problem of additional data can be solved by creating additional element in the input array 
known as ghost shell or halo shells. The value of this shell is usually zero, and they do not contribute to the result, but they could have any other values depending on the boundary condition defining in your problem. We can create the ghost shell by increasing the size of the input array, as is in this example. But we can also modify the code we have seen to compute the convolution and introduce if else condition sentences to check if the filter is close to the border or not and decide if I want to introduce the zero or make a clamp and use uh, the position, the first and the last element. So a parallel implementation using OpenMP can be as easy as shown in this code where the allo shell are ignored for the sake, sake of the simplicity, okay? The work that is done by each thread is the convolution of a subset of elements of the array. And what I'm doing in this uh, implementation is distribute the iteration or distribute the data, depending on if I focus the problem in the task, uh, parallelisms or in the data parallelisms, I uh, make in different approximation, but with the same implementation. And since we are using OpenMP, distributes data among thread is as easy as specify the size of the chunk in the, in the program. For example, the same number of iteration for each thread. Really easy to do or to implement an extensive computation pattern in OpenMP. The implementation of this pattern in other parallel architectures, such a high performance computing cluster or a GPU, will be uh, much different. Since it has a different amount of processor, different memory, hierarchy, and must distribute, and I must distribute the data by hand. But in OpenMP in shared memory, we have, uh, we can do it really, really easy. So here we are. Let's now see how we can use this parallel pattern that is implementing in one dimensional with only one directory. How can we use this to create a complete preprocessing step uh, for, a, for a, an spectral spatial classification scheme? <clears throat> well, this uh, use case is based on this paper uh, that is entitled Wavelet basic classification of hyperspectral image using extended morphological profiles on graphic processing unit. And the work in this paper presented a spectral spatial classification scheme for hyperspectral images, where the scheme was first designed with the focus on classification accuracy, but also uh, thinking in an efficient implementation in shared memory system and in GPU. So we design it and we find, we share for different algorithms and analyze the pattern to see uh, what would be the best choice to create the, the scheme. <clears throat> As we can see in this figure, the scheme has two branches, two branches. In the upper branch, we see a stage of reduction of dimensionality using wavelet, the first stage, and an extraction of spatial features using morphological profile. Dimensionality reduction is a very common preprocessing in hyperspectral image analysis, and the goal is to extract the most relevant information and use it in the next stage of the scheme. And the next stage creates a morphological profile using the new set of features. As the dimensionality is greater than one, even after the production, the result of the second stage is known as an extended morphological profile. The lower branch includes a noise removal stage also using wavelet with the objective of removing artifacts, for example, introduced in the acquisition of the data. The preprocessing data of both branches is combining and used in the final stage by the supervised classifier. And in this work, we use a support vector machine, machine 
support vector matching classifier. The use case is focused on the upper branch that implement the two states of preprocessing using the same pattern, the convolution. Signal denoising is also a common task performed by Wavelet. So at the end, all the preprocessing states really use the same pattern, the stencil computation. To design, the design of this scheme based mainly on convolution has allowed us to implement it efficiently in a shared memory multiprocessor using OpenMP and in GPU using CUDA. But today we will only see the implementation in CPU using OpenMP. <clears throat> the first stage make a reduction of characteristic in the spectral domain using wavelets. The wavelets are mathematical tools for signal processing analysis at different scales, where a discrete wireless transfer of the signal can be computed at the convolution of the signal with two filters. Uh, this is the interesting thing. It can be implemented as a convolution. The signal is approximating using a low pass filter, while the high pass filter are used to bring out the details. We are only need we only need the low pass filter to approximate the signal and reduce the dimensionality as illustrated in these uh, two figures. From the original spectral dimensionality, if I apply a discrete wallet transform, that is, if I do a convolution of this signal, that is the input data, with a filter, I can choose, <clears throat> I have <clears throat> different type of filters to make the convolution, I can half the dimensionality of the of the hyperspectral images. Well, in this case, uh, we apply the discrete well transform two times, so we reduce by four the dimensionality of the hyperspectral image. So, as a discrete well transform of a signal can be computed as a convolution of thing of the signal with the filters, we can implement it in OpenMP as we, as we saw with the simple plasma directive. The filter we use in this work uh, is, uh, it ha has night coefficient and is one of the filters used in the G GPIX 2K compression standard for lossless, lossless compression, okay? So, my input data is the hyperspectral image, and my filter is of size nine, um, in one dimensional, and a one dimensional filter of size nine. Okay. So as we saw the hyperspectral image in this case will be processed in the spectral domain. So we are going to load the data in memory as a pixel vector matrix and follow a data level paralleling. That is, the pixel vector are distributed among different threads and the same one dimensional convolution will be executed by each thread on a different chunk of data as is illustrated in this uh, piece of code. The world is well balanced as the operation is the same for all the pixel vector. The operation is the convolution because I distribute the iteration of the loop and share all the rows of the matrix. So all the threads execute the same, the same operation. So we are going to implement it with the for loop, parallel construction, and with the static scheduling, assigning chunk of equal size to each thread. So all what I need is a parallel opening peak directive indicating the four uh, rate the for the for loop construct that will create a team of thread and then this decide the type of the scheduling static in this in this case and how many rows I'm going to distribute for each thread. And we are going to do it to repeat this several times. So we are going to make four and join thread several times to apply uh, to reduce the dimensionality uh, a half at each uh, convolution, okay? 
In the particular case of this convolution for filter reduction, we will access the all of cells thick, thick cladding in a state of giving them a value of zero. It is representing uh, in this indexing. This is the filter of the convolution. And this is how I solve the problem of the allo cells when I add an element to the left of the first uh, element of the pixel vector or when I, I want to assign to the last element of the pixel vector. I do it cyclically. So when I, at the beginning, I read data from the end. And when, when, I, when I am at the end, I read data from the beginning. And with this uh, indexing, I move the initial uh, position of array among the different threads. So is how I can distribute or how I, how I uh, configure the chunk for this uh, parallel implementation. So all the threads will join the main thread at the end of the process when we end this loop. And with the result of this step, we will create the extended morphological profile. In the next stage of the preprocessing, that where we apply the uh, again the stencil computation pattern, this time it will be in two dimensions. It is still the same pattern, but now uh, basically we need a different shape for the filter and an additional loop to iterate, to iterate uh, over uh, all the position of the filter or of the filter. Morphological profiles are tools for extracting spatial features at different scales, basis, basis or mathematical morphology. And mathematical morphology allows extracting useful features for an image. The technique is based on two basic operators that are erosion and dilation, dilation where the erosion operator shrink objects that are brighter than their surrounding, while the dilation operator expand them. From this basic operation, a set of new tools is created, for example, opening and closing by reconstruction that keep or remove the spatial structure for the image based on a, a structuring element. That is the filter. So again, we are close to the convolution, to the convolution pattern. Opening and closing are used for creating morphological profile using filters of different size, from a smaller to larger size, to remove or keep structures of, of different size uh, present in the image. These filters, these filters, sorry, are known as structural element, but are uh, the kernel, basically, of the convolution. Okay. So by using different size of this filter, I will create create new images and combining of these images, I will create what is known as a morphological profile. So what we have what we have here are a lot, a lot of convolution. Well, I invite you to read the paper by Professor Benedictson that introduced a morphological profile in remote sensing from panchromatic to hyperspectral images, because the theory of mathematical morphology is very interesting, but uh, required an in-depth study to understand the operation of opening and closing by reconstruction. Okay, so I'm going to simplify it to highlight where is the stencil computation pattern. That is are in the erosion and in the delighting operation. Okay. <clears throat> so the the pattern of the stencil is found is found in the use of the structuring element. In this case of the erosion, each pixel for each pixel of the image we will calculate the value with less gray scale intensity within the neighbor inside the filter, okay? To apply an opening by reconstruction after the erosion of the hyperspectral image, we must start an iterative process to keep or remove the spatial structure of the image. 
but as I say, this is out of the scope of this session. You can follow this process of the uh, opening my reconstruction, uh, reading the recommending papers and looking inside the code uh, that is prepared for this use case. As I have uh, an institutory element and have defined an operation that is the minimum, get the minimum value of the of the neighbor within the structure element, what they have is uh, an stasial computation pattern. Okay. For implementing the uh, stasial computation in and create the morphological profile, the, the hyperspectral image will be processed this time in the spatial domain. Okay. The output of the previous state, the other reduction, is now arranged as a it was a pixel vector of matrix, is now arranged to be stored as a two-dimensional uh, array of a spectral band, okay? So each spectral band from the feeder extraction by wavelet is stored one after the other in memory. We follow again a data level parallelisms, where each band is divided into chunks that can be assigned to different threads. In this implementation, each thread will perform an erosion followed by morphological reconstruction on an entire, uh, on all the pixels of the same spectral band. So I'm assigning very large chunks to each, uh, to each thread. And again, I only need one pragma directly to parallelize all the computation to create an extended morphological profile. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to share, distribute this spectral band to each one of the uh, thread in the team. And um, each thread is going to do the erosion, that is the uh, extensive, extensive computation. And then we'll do the second part, that is the reconstruction to perform the opening by reconstruction. So each thread has a lot of work to do, but it's again uh, well balanced among uh, the different threads. So we are going to implement again with a parallel for loop, as indicated here, using an static scheduling assigning chunk of equal side to each thread. The problem of the ALO that is related to the stencil computation is solved solved here, uh, making a clamp in these two instruction. That is, if I'm going, when I'm going to access an element out of, of my array to the left, to the upper, or to the right, or to the bottom, I'm going to clamp the index, and I'm going to get the element at the border. It's another way to uh, resolve the problem of the allo cell in the stencil computation. And the filter is found here in the structure element in the filter with the operation that find the minimum value of the current pixel among all the pixel within the, uh, the neighboring pixel that are uh, within the structure element. When all the thread finish their work here, at the end of the parallel region, we will have in memory the extended morphological profile. Okay. At this point, all the threads are synchronizing to proceed to the next stage. So let me now uh, show you some number of the implementation of these two step uh, in CPU using OpenMP uh, in a CPU with four cores and a thread using the hyperspectral image of Pavia. That is a very well-known image in, in remote sensing, okay. Well, we can see here how uh, in these uh, graphics, uh, the execution times in blue for the feature reduction and in red for uh, the extending morphological profile. Okay, we can see how uh, in the first column, the sequential, the sequential 
execution and how the uh, execution time decrease at the time that I uh, incorporate more elements of processing, more thread uh, to the team of thread. In numbers, uh, or make it an analysis uh, of the speed up that quantify the performance used using uh, per thread. We can see that when I use two thread, I have an speed up of almost two, 1.7. For the, uh, this column is for the uh, filter reduction for the wireless, and this column is for the extended morphological profile and how the speed up increase when I uh, increase the number of thread. Another way to see how uh, good is your implementation, uh, not only by this number, is uh, using the efficiency that gives you an awareness of how much uh, time are the processor uh, doing, uh, doing work or doing, uh, doing computation that is related to the speed up divided by the number of processors. 100% of deficit, which is a theoretical base case, but let's say over or close to 100% is a good uh, indicator that your implementation is, is, is well done and is efficient and will scale when you incorporate new threads. So now for end this uh, use case, you will find in the repository of our research center, a copy of the implementation that we have seen of this use case, the one dimensional uh, convolution for filtering reduction and the two dimensional convolution for erosion and creating the full extending morphological profile. Okay, this uh, the the code is you can execute the code completely. And also uh, very simple to execute first uh, SACSP operation implementing OpenMP. That's all. So if you want to know more about remote sensing and parallel computing, don't miss the rest of the session of this summer school. Um, I'll invite you to visit our research webpage at cities.gal for reading the publication of remote sensing and high performance computers, computing of our uh, hyperspectral uh, team. Here you can review the main bibliography you see for uh, this presentation that are the paper of the use case and some theory of parallel patterns, as well as something about architecture and the paper related to mathematical morphology. So that's all, thank you for attending and I open to any question that you want to, to ask related to, to this use case. Thank you, Pablo. I don't know if you are listening. Yes, I, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to stop sharing the presentation. Ah, uh, oh, I, okay, I must do this. In order to see you. I stop sharing, okay? I stop the presentation, the, oh, the sharing. It's okay. it's okay now. Vale, okay. You have uh, any questions to, to Pablo or any comment or related to other possible implementations or um, curiosity, any any kind of of comment, feel free to to make a any any yeah. I don't know if uh, Gabriel is working. Yeah. Without doing anything? Thank you. Do you have a suggestion or okay. 
the representation of uh, the libraries in uh, Python with uh, which we can do this uh, tensor computation, for example, or also these are different types of parallelization. No, I, I'm not listening very, very well because okay. it's some kind of echo in the. Yeah, and now, please. Better. So, can you hear me now? Can you hear now, Pablo? Yes, but th there is a little of, uh, echo. If you can uh, replicate be. the question. I don't know if it would be necessary to cancel this. I think I come back. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can uh, come, come here. It's not a problem. <laughs> you are here. Yeah. So yeah, I have. Yeah. I can see you there, so you have the, the image there. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I have a question regarding uh, the suggestions of how to implement those solutions in Python. Uh, of a uh, stencil computation for, in particular, uh, which libraries would be able to process it, that concept? In, in Python? Yes. Well, I actually uh, don't work with Python, but uh, you can find uh, a specific library for high performance computing in Python. I don't know, I don't remember the name right now, but uh, it's not, actually it's not with OpenMP. Anyway, uh, as we, we, we see at the introduction, you have uh, many options for, for parallel programming. So in the case of Python, uh, I think the best option is use a specific library, libraries for, for, for Python, okay? Uh, you can use, uh, I think there are some for uh, CPU and uh, you can also program in Python for GPU. Basically, what you need to do is uh, find in your library <laughs> how to uh, split the array because I the, the best choice for Python, I think, is uh, data level parallelism. So you need to, to find a way to split the data among different, uh, among the different thread. And when you find how to do that in Python, you only need to code a simple loop for the convolution. And probably in Python, this uh, will be uh, very easy to implement, I think. Okay, so basically so, just uh, multi-threading and then uh, a loop for... Uh, exactly, for so the, the, the implementation is, is, is uh, sequential, sequential mm -hmm. because, you, don't, because uh, you cannot, you can also uh, share the computation of the of the of the stencil, but if the stencil is very small, is it is not worth it's not worth. So the best option in best option in this case, I think, is uh, do the convolution uh, in Python in sequential, and then find in the library uh, how to split the array among the different processors. Yes, but the problem is that loops in Python are extremely slow. So it's just, yeah, now, now, now I see probably it's better to use C code in Python or something like that. Because yeah, that's it. it. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's lower than other language, that's true. But I think there is, uh, let me do a very quick search just to see if I hit. Mm -hmm. Well, if you find in Google, you search in Google high performance computing with Python, uh, you will see some libraries and, and how to do some multiprocessing using Python. And maybe you can get some performance, you can improve the performance of your, of your implementation. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Pablo. Uh, you have a question in the chat regarding the link available in GitLab. Yes, it's, uh, I need to make a, a little cleanup of the code because uh, the use, 
the work in the paper has a CPU uh, implementation open in P and also the GPU using Q CUDA. So there are a lot of noise in this in this source code. So I will try to end the cleanup today and update the the repository with the with the source code. Okay, I will add, uh, send a message to Gabriel so he can tell you when is the the code available. Sorry, code... sorry, sorry for the comment, but I ran out of time and I couldn't uh, blow up the code. Perfect. But it's already published, so it's <laughs> it's already time to to blow up there. Okay. Thank you. Tell us when the code is clean, and and we will share the information. Mm -hmm. uh, the this presentation will be available as the other information through the GRS uh, uh, YouTube channel, so we will have all the information there. Uh, in case you have to, you need to contact Pablo. The the contact details are also in the presentation. And any comment? Any comment? Additional comments or questions or Perfect. In case you have any questions related to the code or any advice uh, regarding how to implement different codes or stencils, uh, you can also contact him or, or any of the teachers, of course. Well, then we stop here. Uh, thank you, Pablo. See you. See you tomorrow or in a couple of days. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank and we we'll go to the coffee break. Let's enjoy your coffee. <laughs> okay, thank bye, you. Bye, Pablo. Bye, bye. We're going to begin with, with this part of the course. In this case, Alvaro Ordóñez from University of Santiago de Compostela uh, is going to present different HPC solutions for the registration of hyper and, I and multi spectral remote sensing images. He will uh, give some uh, an overview of, of uh, programming HPC systems uh, for these applications, uh, and he will be available for for the questions. If you want to interrupt him, please give me a sign, and we stop and and solve the questions. So he's going. He's up. Um, uh, this was a very informal presentation because he's. Uh, PhD, uh, a PhD student, uh, is a, a postdoc student at the University of uh, Santiago, and he works in uh, mainly, uh, his work is mainly focused on registration algorithms uh, for remote sensing at different uh, levels. So he will explain uh, details of some of the implementations. Thank you, Alvaro, when you want. Thank you, Dora. Can you listen to me? Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the, all, uh, the organization for, for inviting me. As Dora said, my name is Alvaro, and I am a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Uh, I work in the same uh, group as Pablo Quesada. Uh, during this hour, I am going to try to explain how we how we use some HPC solutions in our remote sensing problems, specifically to register multispectral and hyperspectral images. You can stop me at any time if you have uh, any doubts, of, as uh, Dora said. First, I will explain what is uh, image registration and its motivation. Also the motivation to use HPC solutions and a brief introduction to shared and distributed memory systems. Then uh, I will present two cases in which we have used distributed memory systems to speed up the registration uh, of multispectral and also hyperspectral images. In each case, uh, we have followed a different parallelization approach. And finally, I'm going to share with you a code example uh, so uh, you can try out uh, some of the things that uh, we are going to, to see today during this lecture. So let's begin. What is uh, image registration? Image registration consists in aligning images uh, of the same thing which have been taken at different times and from different viewpoints. 
Moreover, uh, they usually uh, present changes in objects, in illumination, and may not cover exactly the, the same region. The goal of the image registration, the goal of the registration of, of two images is to determine the geometric transformation that maps one image into the other. Let's see an example. An example uh, of the registration problem uh, can be seen in, in this video. The first image is the reference image, the hyperspectral image of Pavia University. The second image is the target image, the image that we want uh, to align with respect uh, to the first one. So the registration process uh, consists in finding the scale factor, the rotation angle, and the translation parameters to align this image, to align this image, the target image, with respect to the reference image to obtain the registered image, as you are seeing, as you are watching in this video. What is the motivation? Uh, registration is a trivial fundamental task in many applications, such as change detection, monitoring our resources, climate change, among others. Before solving these tasks, the images must be aligned as in this example of change detection. Uh, moreover, uh, most hyperspectral um, most hyperspectral registration methods in the literature opt to ignore ignore the execution time in real time applications for example disaster and damage control the execution time becomes crucial and particularly now more because the number of the images available in the space agency databases like uh, BIRIS is continuously increasing other uh, registration algorithms uh, in the literature don't take into account the extra information contained in the hyperspectral images. The reason is they don't want to cope with the high execution time needed to process this extra information. To avoid uh, dealing with the high computational cost, they uh, use the hyperspectral images as one band uh, images or even as RGB images. In this case, they sacrifice, they sacrifice better registration accuracy to not exploit the spectral information. So what is the solution to, to both problems? Uh, to carry out implementations, HPC implementations, to use all the spectral information and to mitigate the high computational cost. So, Depending on the problem, on the registration problem that we have to, 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 to solve, there are different cases. There are different cases. In this session, we are going to see three. The first one, registration of bands of the same image. The second one, registration of time series of multi and hyperspectral images. And the third one, registration of images of the same location to build an orthomosaic. We are going to see one by one uh, with uh, an example. The first case. Let's, uh, let's begin uh, illustrating this first case using an example. In this figure, uh, we can see a multispectral image of five bands uh, taken by the MikaSense Red Edge MX sensor. As we can see, these bands are not registered. So, uh, the this first case, case consists in aligning bands of the same multispectral images. What happens if we, we generate a false color composite of this image with the bands not register? This faxi edge and separation of the uh, green, blue, and red channels are clearly observed, for example, in the roof of this uh, house or in these small uh, constructions here. So, this problem disappears if we uh, register the bands. So this is the false color composite of the bands with the bands with the bands already registered. So the difficulty of this uh, case lies on we have to perform a lot of registration. In particular, each band has to, uh, must be registered with respect to the to, to one of them typically the, the first one. So we have to perform many, registr many, many registrations in a reasonable time as each bank needs to be registered to respect to the first one. 
one registration per number of bands minus one per number of images that we have. So we can advance to say that here there is a parallelizable problem. A different case is, the, is this one. It's when we have different images of the same location, but taken at different times. I am talking about time series uh, images. In this figure, we can see uh, two hyperspectral images taken in the biological preserve of Jasper Ridge in California. The first image was captured in 2009, and the second image was uh, captured in 2010, as you can see in different seasons uh, of the year. As can be seen in this animation, the images are not registered. So in order to analyze how the time affected to the biological preserve, we need to register the images. Uh, this is uh, what we can see in this, in this D image, in this animation. We can see the result of the registration process showing the correctly registered superposition of both images. What is the challenge in this case? So the first one is that space agency generate large amount of data from the same area by taking at different times. So all this data must be processed. In addition, we have to perform a, a high number of expensive registration as we are processing hyperspectral images with high spatial and spectral resolutions. It could be also the case that the complete image don't fit in memory. Um, thus, uh, it is another. Thus, it is another problem uh, in which HPC solutions can help us, as we have to compute a high number of expensive registrations in re in a reasonable time. And finally, this is our last case: registering images of the same location to build an orthomosaic. In this case, we have different five-band multispectral images taken by uh, UAV in the Oitaben River, uh, River Basin here in Galicia, in Spain. Uh, the, objective, the objective of these uh, images was uh, used then to monitor the vegetation of the river basins. As the identification of vegetation changes is especially difficult, the quality of the registration is, is crucial. So in this case, we have to perform different registrations to build an orthomosaic, that is, to build a complete image of the flight. And this is the resulting of the mosaic after performing one registration per image. Here we have a register like uh, 200 images in total. Here you can see uh, the house, this house, this house, it can be see, seen here. And here in this line, the, the Oitaben River. The constraint in this case, depending on the number of images that we have. In this case, as I said, 200. Uh, but in fact, in this example, we truly have two cases. The first that we saw, uh, as because the bands of each image uh, have to be registered, like in the first case. And next, the different images um, have to be registered to build this orthomosaic. So we are talking about a double case. So in this double case, HPC technologies and parallelism become even more necessary because of the high number of uh, expensive registration that we have to perform. And finally, to, to, uh, to finish uh, with the introduction, I want to show you some ways to exploit HPC uh, architectures focused on accelerating uh, high computational workloads in remote sensing problems. As you probably already know, uh, a thread is a sequence of instructions within a program that can be executed independently of other code. The general idea is to slice our problem in tasks that can be executed in parallel by threads. In this figure, uh, we are showing a shared memory device. It has several CPUs, and each CPU has many cores, these boxes, uh, that can run uh, various threads. In a shared memory device like this, the memory space is shared, hence the name. 
the developer in this case has to take care how these threads access to the shared memory, how the threads in the different CPUs access to the uh, shared memory to avoid uh, situations like, for example, two threads writing of the same memory location at the same time. To do that, we have OpenMP. OpenMP is the standard for multi-threaded parallel programming on shared memory devices. We already knew because Pablo explained it uh, in the lecture before. One step uh, further is to add accelerators like uh, GPUs to our system. In this example, I only have one for simplicity, one GPU, but it could be more, two, four, on go on. This way, we can take advantage of the hundreds of GPU cores at the same time as we are also using the different uh, CPUs and their cores. So in addition to OpenMP, to use the GPU, we also need uh, CUDA. What happens uh, if we buy more machines like this and interconnect them, for example, with a network? We build a small cluster, but it could be it could be larger depending on the number of, of nodes that we buy or, or install. So now we can distribute the data even more and increase the parallelism of our codes. But we have an additional constraint because we have to coordinate more machines. We have to coordinate the different GPUs on each node the different GPUs of each node and also the different nodes. So we have to coordinate more things like the developers. The standard way to, to do it in this uh, case is using MPI. MPI allows us to exchange data between uh, nodes, exchanging messages through the network. In the end, we have a large but distributed memory, uh, hence the name. So the cases that I am going to present uh, today, the real cases that uh, we work uh, on it, are accelerated using uh, this kind of systems. They are uh, developed to run in distributed uh, memory systems. So let me present the first case in which, in which we have used HPC technologies to speed up the image registration process. In this case, we have different sets of multispectral uh, images of five bands uh, taken on different UAV flights. As the images of each set are taken over the same area, we want to build an ortho mosaic. So, here we have uh, two problems. The first is that the bands of each uh, multispectral image, or also called frame, are not registered. So this, uh, this is solved in the first registration level, this one. One band is chosen, uh, typically the first one, and the other bands are registered with respect uh, to it. The second with the first, the third with the first, the fourth with the first, and go on. So the bands are registered in this first level. And here obtain the five band multispectral image with the bands already registered. Next, the other problem is that the multispectral images with the bands already registered need to be registered to build this ortho mosaic. And this is built in this second level of registration. So the multispectral images with the bands already aligned are registered in this process together to build this ortho mosaic to obtain the complete image of the flight. So in this case, the image resolution are not so high, but the difficulty lies on that we have to perform a lot of registration, a lot of registration to register the bands and a lot of registration to register the different multispectral image because we have to do it one by one. So the algorithm used uh, is the hyperspectral cathode. 
this algorithm, it was specially designed to register hyperspectral remote sensing images. And the method starts performing a, a bank selection in order to keep only uh, to keep only the relevant spectral information. We have here our multispectral images, and in the second step, the algorithm performs a band selection to keep only the, the relevant uh, bands. Then the method extracts key points in the different selected bands. In the next steps, the algorithm matches the key points uh, of both images to calculate the geometric transformation that allows us to register the images. We want to accelerate this algorithm. The first thing that we did it was ported it to run entirely on GPU. I am not going. Uh, I am not going to go into the details of that topic, as I think that you have a tomorrow a talk about uh, talk about GPUs. But um, so I am going to focus in this last uh, in the in this last architecture. So the second thing. Uh, is uh, how to accelerate it using more than one GPU. And one step further is uh, how to accelerate it using different nodes with multiple GPUs. We are going to see how to do this implementation in the following uh, slides. Let us start in, well, if you have any question, please stop me and I can I can ask, answer any questions uh, if, you, if, you have, if you have it, okay? So let's start uh, by getting to know uh, the cluster we are going to use. In Galicia, we have available for the scientific community a supercomputer, the Finisterrae. Well, right now we have, uh, we have two supercomputers because uh, we have a new one, the third version of this uh, one with more modern hardware. Well, we will see, we will see it later. So as I saying, uh, the supercomputer is managed. Uh, the supercomputer, the Finisterrae, is managed by the supercomputer center of Galicia, CESGAM, and has more than uh, 300 nodes. But only four nodes uh, uh, has uh, have uh, GPUs, and we can only use concurrently three of them. So we can say that we are going to use a cluster of three nodes. So. Each node uh, has uh, two uh, CPUs in the Haswell with uh, 128 gigabytes of main memory and four uh, GPUs per node for NVIDIA Tesla key 80 GPUs. The nodes are connected by an infinite bank network. And since we have the same hardware of each node, uh, we are talking about an homogeneous cluster. Regarding the images that we are going to use to uh, test our proposal, three different data sets captured in different UAV flights uh, were used. Each data set uh, has a different number of images or also called frames. As I said uh, before, the number of uh, the frames, uh, the number of frames of each data set depends on the flight conditions of the UAV. Each frame consists of five bands. Um, so the question is, how can we speed up the registration of these data sets using, uh, using, what is, what, using uh, this cluster? Thus, in this example, we have three data sets. And our three nodes, and our, our cluster with three nodes. So the solution is quite obvious, because this is a small example. We can assign one data set. We can assign uh, one data set to each uh, node. So in this way, each node will register one different data set at the same time. The master node is going to process the data set zero, made up of three images, three spectral images. The slave node one is going to process the second the data set one with uh, four uh, multispectral images, and the same for the slave node two they are going to register a different data set at the same time. If we have more than three data sets, we will assign 
we will assign them cyclically. I mean, if we have a four data set, it will be assigned to the first node. If we have a fifth one, it will be assigned to the to the second node and go on. So this initial distribution is performed by the master node using MPI. The master node distributes the data to the other nodes using MPI. But now the question is, how do you distribute the work within each node since each, each uh, node has uh, four GPUs? We use the four GPUs to register uh, the uh, one multispectral image or the three uh, at the same time or, or what, what we are going to do. We are going to say now. In this figure, we can see what happens inside one node. Once a node has received a data set, here the data set, each frame, I mean a five band multispectral image, is distributed across the available GPUs. This is uh, what we can see in this figure. So each frame is copied from the uh, host memory to the corresponding GPU memory. One frame to each GPU, the frame zero to GPU zero the frame one to the GPU one, the frame two to GPU two, and the frame three to GPU three. So a thread is created for each GPU to start registering the bands of each frame in parallel using the algorithm that I present before, hyperspectral CACE. So in this step, each GPU is going to uh, work in parallel, registering different uh, bands of different uh, multispectral images of different frames. So the second band is registered with the first one, the third with the first one, and uh, and go on. So we use the four uh, GPUs at the same time, and we can not uh, and we can not forget that at the same time this process is a uh, running at the same time in the other nodes. So we have like multiple uh, parallelization levels. Once all the bands uh, have a, uh, once all, all the bands of all the spectrals, uh, of, sorry, of all the frames uh, has been a uh, register here, we, here we can see the bands already registered. We have to uh, register the, the images, the frames to build the orthomosaic. So the frame zero, this one, the first one, is copied from the GPU zero memory to the memory of the other GPUs. And next, the registration of the different phrase, frames with respect to the uh, frame zero uh, can begin. Again, each GPU computes these registrations in parallel, we are registering one frame. This is one, one pair of frames, another pair of frames, and another one in parallel at the same time. Time, And then when we have obtained the result, the, the, the frame register, it has to be copied back from the different GPU memories to the CPU memory. And finally, each node send sends uh, all the register uh, frames to the master node using MPI. Any doubt until here? Let's continue then. So this table uh, shows the execution time for each node. And for each... Alvaro. Yep. Could you stop one moment? We have one question. Please yep. come here. We have time. Yeah. Hola. Uh, hi, Alvaro. Hi. Um, so just in the image registration process, you mentioned that you use uh, CASE, right? Yep. Um, but in my experience, CASE is the um, most computational uh, expensive algorithm for this kind of procedure. So, um, and I know you're trying to accelerate this process, but why instead of uh, using CASE, you, you don't use uh, like SIFT or SORF or, or, or other uh, key point feature descriptors? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. We use it because in the second level, uh, 
in the second registration level here, well, the images has a lot of viewpoint changes. Um, in some cases, like in this house, we can, see, like in the house, we can show the different uh, 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 roofs, no, um, walls of the of the house. I mean, because the drone uh, flies over the house and it takes images from all the angles. So we have a lot of viewpoint, uh, viewpoint changes. And in this, um, in this second uh, registration level, uh, some alg algorithms like uh, uh, SURF uh, doesn't manage very well uh, to register these viewpoint changes. Uh, it, uh, do it, uh, it does very, very well in this first uh, case because we are registering bands of the same image. There is not viewpoint changes there. But in the second level, we have uh, uh, observed some uh, registration accuracy problems because these uh, viewpoint changes. Okay. So it would, yeah, it would be interesting to use for, we can use a SARF or SIFT mm -hmm. in this first uh, step. But I have to say another thing that uh, in the descriptor part, we are using a SIFT. We are only using CAFE in the, um, in the, in the detector. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Alvaro. You can go on. I'm going to mute my microphone. Perfect, thank you. So as I was saying, this table shows the execution time for each node, GPU, and for each uh, node, GPU, and a stage. As each node is working in parallel, uh, the time required for registering the three data set is this, 825 uh, seconds which are corresponds to the node within the highest execution time. The master node, I mean the master node. So the reason is because it is the responsible to distributing the data to the other nodes and to receive the results from the other nodes also. And then to write them to disk. So this is the reason that is the, the time that we register, the time that the master node needs because the other nodes uh, computing is co are computing in parallel to this. If we have only one node, uh, the total time needed would be approximately the sum of these three, uh, of the time of these three uh, nodes. So as you can see, we are obtaining a quite good acceleration. But if we use the CPUs instead of the GPUs to run the algorithm, the algorithm this table uh, compares the multi implementation, this one uh, with a multi-core CPU implementation. The same uh, data distribution is carry, carried out in both implementations, but in the case of the multi-CPU one, instead of uh, the four GPUs, we are using the 25 GPU cores available per node. So we are running the OpenMP version of the Hyperspectral Cafe. As can be seen, uh, the multi-CPU version takes almost four times longer than the multi-GPU version. So it's a good uh, idea to parallelize our algorithm first uh, to run it in, uh, in GPUs. So, let me present the second case in which we have used HPC technologies to speed up the registration process. In this case, we have followed a different approach as the algorithm uh, is parallel, parallelized at low level. Uh, we will see it. What is the problem to solve in this case? Uh, we already know. It is the case that we want to register pairs of hyperspectral images taken at different dates and probably from different viewpoints. We want to register this image, the target image with, with respect to this other, uh, other image, the reference image. And here we can see the, uh, the target image already registered. So what is the challenge here? That these hyperspectral images, in addition to their uh, spectral, resol high spectral resolution, also have high spatial resolution. 
And moreover, we are showing an example of only two images, but we have several images to register in the space agency databases, like abilities. So let me briefly explain the algorithm use. In this case, we use the hyperspectral Fourier matching algorithm. It is not as resilient uh, to be point changes like uh, as hyperspectral CACE, but it is more uh, computational efficient, which is as an important point uh, since we will be processing images with large um, spectral and spatial resolutions. So in this case, as we are going to process images with large, uh, large uh, resolutions, it doesn't make sense to use a hyperspectral cathode because um, this uh, because the this high spatial resolution and also because these images uh, don't present viewpoint changes. So in this case, using an algorithm like this is a quite good idea. So hyperspectral Fourier matching uh, is a registration method based on the computation of correlation between images using a fast Fourier transform. This is the reason because it is a, a computationally uh, efficient. I don't want to bore you too much, but we need to know some details of the algorithm because uh, we need it to parallelize it at a low level. Hyperspectral Fourier matching has six main stages, uh, but we can summarize them in four steps. The first one, uh, in the first step, Initialization, the images are read from disk to memory and some auxiliary data is uh, initialized. Initialized, initialized, initialized. In the second step, the preprocessing, a principal component analysis is performed to reduce the hyperspectral images to only eight principal components. This step could be performed using other methods of dimensionality reduction, but the principal component analysis uh, method allows us to keep the most relevant information, uh, obtaining good registration results. And then the registration uh, is applied to pair of principal uh, components. So in the third step, the correlation between each pair of principal component is computed by calculating a different uh, fast uh, Fourier uh, transform at different accuracy levels. In this step, in, uh, in the final of this step, the information uh, from the different principal components are integrated. This integration highlights some peaks in the correlation map. And in this last step, we have to analyze the 58 peaks to obtain the scale factor, the rotation angle and the shift parameters in order to register uh, both images. So the question is how to accelerate the algorithm, in this case, at low level, using different nodes with multiple GPUs. A good starting point is to see what steps are the expensive ones in order to focus on them. Let's do it for the image that we saw uh, before, the Jasper uh, Ridge the biological preserve of Jasper Ridge. As you can see, uh, for that image, the third step, the principal component processing and composition is the uh, expensive, is the most expensive one because it involves a lot of fast Fourier computations to compute the correlation between the two hyperspectral images. The second most expensive is the, is the fourth one because we have to analyze uh, 50 peaks and rotate and scale the uh, target image several times. As you can see, with a small spatial resolution hyperspectral images like, like this, we can already achieve good speed ups by porting the code to, to CUDA and running it on a single GPU. We are obtaining a speed up uh, 200 times, more or less. So it will be our first case to port it to run on one single GPU. But we want to go one step further, as I said uh, in my introduction, we want to parallelize it using a cluster. So we need to know how our cluster is again, at the, it's the same case as our previous problem. 
we want to know how our cluster is. And typically, it's the cluster that we have available in our university, in our research center, or in our community in scientific community. So in this case, it is an heterogeneous GPU cluster, as each uh, node has different hardware. The cluster belongs to our colleagues at the University of Valladolid, and it consists of two nodes connected by a network an Ethernet network. The first node has uh, two CPUs Intel Xeon with six cores each and four GPUs. Uh, two are GTX uh, Titan Black with six gigabytes uh, of memory, and the other two are Tesla uh, K, uh, K40C with 12, 12 uh, gigabytes of memory. As you can see, two kinds of uh, GPUs, totally different uh, characteristics. And the second node has uh, two uh, CPUs, Intel Xeon, Intel Xeon Platinum with uh, uh, 48 cores each, and only one GPU, one Tesla B100 with uh, 32 uh, gigabytes of memory. As you can see, this node is to totally different with respect to the first one. We have a more modern uh, hardware here. So as I said before, a good starting point will be to start parallelizing the expensive step. But as I am going to explain how we did it in all of them, I will start explaining from the beginning, from the step two uh, to the last step in order to follow uh, an order. So how can we distribute the workload uh, between the different GPUs and nodes of the cluster? And consequently, how do we distribute the data? In this second step, uh, pre-processing, a filter, a Blackman filter, and a principal component analysis are performed to reduce the hyperspectral images to eight principal components. So to compute the principal component analysis, a GPU needs to have needs to have all the spectral bands of the image. And then we only, for this, we only have one option, slice the images in groups of rows. Both hyperspectral images are distributed among the different GPUs of the cluster in groups, in groups of rows using MPI, like we are watching here. This way, each GPU has a piece of each image with the complete spectral dimension. For example, the GPU uh, zero has the first group of rows of the hyperspectral images with all the spectral bands. But if we are talking in the spatial uh, dimension, the GPU zero only has so a, a, a small part, so uh, the first uh, group of rows of the image, the, the first slice we can set. And um, please note that the GPU four belongs to the second node. So the first node has to send this group of rows, of rows through the network to the second uh, node using MPI. If you have any question, again, ask me whatever you want. But it's not uh, as simple as only scatter the image in slices. We, have must, uh, we must be careful with data dependencies. Here we have an slice, which is stored in GPU zero. zero. I mean, this slice, this small slice of the hyperspectral image is represented here. The, uh, and this is another slice on, in another GPU. For example, it could be this one in GPU uh, four. So the first thing that we have to do it in this step two is to apply the Blackman filter. As we don't need the spatial uh, information, I mean, the other pixel values of the other slices, I mean, to apply the Blackman filter here, we don't need this slice. So the Blackman filter is applied here because there is, another, there is any data dependencies. So we can do it in parallel in different GPUs. We don't have a data dependencies. It is the, the base uh, case for a developer. But then in the rest of the step, we have to compute the principal component analysis. And to compute the principal component analysis, 
we need to calculate the mean value of all the pixels of each band. I mean, we have to compute the mean value of the, all the pixels of the first band. I mean, we need all the slices. We need the complete bands. So, but in this case, uh, each GPU has an, uh, an, a different slide, so we can do it. So how can we do it if, if GPU has a piece of each BAM? We need the complete BAM. So easily, if GPU carries out a partial operation, a partial sum of all the pixel values of its slices. So then uh, we need that each GPU shares these partial results and each partial results to the rest of GPUs. And we do that with an MPI, MPI or reduce operation. This operation is repeated again and again in the different steps that I am not uh, 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 putting here uh, uh, through the feasible component analysis computation. The GPU uh, computes partial results and shares the data that the other GPUs needs to continue process uh, slices in parallel. So summarizing, at the end of this step, we will, we, we will get a principal uh, components, but it is distributed in groups of rows across the different GPUs and nodes. Same as the beginning, groups of rows with all the spectral domain uh, distributed in GPUs, but at the end, of this step, you obtain the same, but uh, only the eight principal components. The eight principal components slice in different GPUs. So once the principal component has been computed, as I said, we kept the first eight principal components. So next, uh, the th step three consists in computing the fast Fourier transforms and correlation on pairs of principal components. For example, the first principal component of the reference image here with the uh, prin first principal component of the target image are uh, computed uh, together. You compute the correlation of this first pair of principal components. The same for the second pair of principal components until the eighth pair of principal components. So we can easily parallelize uh, this step. One GPU, can, uh, one principal of components can be computed in parallel on a different GPU. I mean, this uh, pine line, this workload, workload pine line can be computed in parallel in, one G, in GPU zero, for example, this one in GPU one, and we are processing the different principal components at the same time in different uh, GPUs and nodes. But we have a problem. We need the complete principal component on the same GPU. And now we have slices of each principal component distributed across the different GPUs. We have this. And we need uh, to have, again, this, but reduced to eight. So, we have to change from a row-based uh, row based distribution to a band-based one. So each GPU, uh, as I said, has a group of rows of eight principal components. Here we can see the slide zero, which is stored in the GPU zero. Here we can see the slide two, which is GPU in, is stored in the GPU one. And another one, for example, the slide five is stored in the GPU four. So, each GPU has a group of rows of rows of the eight principal components. This means that each GPU has to send its slice to the corresponding GPU. For example, we are going to reconstruct this first principal component in GPU zero. The first slice, this first slice of the principal component is already in the GPU zero. So nothing, nothing happens in this case. We already have in this GPU the, the data that we need. But what happens with the second slice? The second slice of this first principal component is in GPU one. So this slice is sent to the GPU zero using an MPI send operation. The third slice of this principal 
uh, first principal component is in GPU 2. This slice is sent to the GPU 0 using, again, the same operation, the MPI send operation. And same occurs for the rest of the slices. We have already reconstructed the first principal component in GPU 0. And the same occurs for the rest of principal components. A pair of uh, principal components is assigned to one GPU. The first principal, uh, the first principal component to GPU zero, the second to GPU one, the third to GPU three, and the fourth for, uh, to GPU three, and the uh, fifth to GPU four. But what happens? We we have assigned a pair of principal components to each GPU. What happens with the six principal component, with the seven principal component, and the eight principal component if we have only five GPUs? In a homogeneous cluster, as the finished array, a solution would be to distribute them uh, cyclically. I mean, equal distribution. For example, uh, the six uh, principal component to the GPU zero, the seven to the GPU one, and the eight to the GPU two. As we have a cluster with uh, with nodes with equal uh, hardware, but it's not the case. We have available an heterogeneous cluster with different kinds of GPUs and with different kinds of CPUs. So uh, the, the computing performance of each node is totally different. So each type of GPU and CPU will be able to handle a different workload. So a second, options, uh, a second option would be to assign a different number of principal components depending on the global memory uh, of each GPU looking for this uh, date of uh, each uh, GPU. And the third option consists in assigning them according to the execution time that a single GPU uh, needs to register uh, two small images on its own. As you can see in this table, the best performance uh, for this case, for the case that uh, each GPU registers performs a complete registration of uh, uh, this uh, image, the execution times are this. So we can see that the best performance is achieved by the big 100 GPU, as it is the modern one. If we, if we calculate how much faster uh, the big 100 is in comparison with the Titan Black and the Key 40, uh, we can see that it's uh, four times faster than the Titan Black and five times faster than the Key 40. We can say then that the B100 can do at least four times more work in the same amount of time than the other uh, two GPU models. So according to that, the following workload distributions uh, is carried out. One pair of principal component is assigned to each Titan Black and one pair of principal components is assigned to each Key 40. The other four pairs of principal components are assigned to be the B100. So this GPU, the B100, are going to work double. This is the loser one, <laughs> the, the GPU loser in this case. So in this figure, we can see the final workload distribution for this uh, third step. The four GPUs on node zero will process the four uh, pairs of principal components, while the other four pairs will be processed by the single GPU on node one, by the B100. So, yeah, in this uh, figure, we can see uh, clearly how uh, we change from a data distribution based on uh, rows to a band based. And it's depending on the necessary, uh, necessity, is uh, depending on the necessities that we have in this part of the, in each part of the algorithm. So, at the end of this step, we have uh, obtained one correlation map, uh, one correlation map per prior principal component. And that is, is one correlation map uh, on each GPU. And to take into account the information from all the principal components, the correlation maps are combined in the master nodes here using MPI. So the nodes has to send all the data that they, they, they compute to the master node. 
we are already in the last step of the algorithm, peak processing. We are finishing. So we can see in more detail in this figure uh, what operations are carried out in this step, in the peak processing step. Uh, summarizing the transformation, this to register the hyperspectral images are recovered from these peaks in the combined map. This is the combined, combined map that we are watching here. So from each peak, a possible registration, a possible registration is obtained, but we don't know what is the peak, which is going to give us the correct registration parameters. We have to analyze the first principal, uh, the first uh, largest peaks. So the master GPU uh, selects uh, these 50 largest peaks in the combined map, and then it distributes these peaks across the cluster uh, to process uh, them in parallel according to the workload balancing strategy that we saw uh, before. I mean, the big 100 are going to process more peaks than the others. Each GPU um, in the cluster carries out these operations uh, for each received peak and returns a possible scale factor, rotation angle, and shift parameters to the master node. So the master node has to wait uh, to have all the partial results from the other nodes. And finally, they, uh, the master node choose the best one. So it, it's a tough, a more tough parallelization approach as the previous one, as we are parallelizing the algorithm at low level. Uh, results, in this table, we can see the execution times for the different workload balancing scenarios. Um, Secretly, memory and execution time. I mean, these balancing scenarios, if you, these ones. The first column shows the, the spatial resolution of the images tasted. We have scaled the images to analyze the scalability of our parallelization. If we assign a equal word to each GPU, I mean, if we assign a same number of peaks or a same number of principal components to each GPU, the execution times are longer, as you are uh, seeing. Since the B100 outperforms of the other GPUs, I mean, the B100 will be waiting for the other GPUs to finish their work. Otherwise, uh, if we distribute the work according to the amount of memory, memory of each GPU, the performance improves as it increases the amount of work performed by the B100. Uh, it alleviates the load of the other GPUs. However, it's not enough uh, to compensate the computing capabilities of the B100, and the best workload balancing strategy is using the execution time, as can be seen. And for small images, a shared memory device with various GPUs could be enough. Maybe in our case, we don't need a cluster. We only want nodes, we only want computer with uh, different uh, GPUs could be enough. In this table, we see the execution times using the same parallelization scheme, but using uh, a single node with uh, uh, one, two, and four GPUs, and with different image sizes. So as you can see, the speed up obtained, the acceleration obtained is better when the image size is large, and also when we have a higher number of uh, GPUs to compute uh, the registration process. To summarize it, in the first case that I present, we have to register different uh, data set of five bands uh, of five band multispectral images. We have a large uh, number of registration as first we have to register uh, the bands and of each image and then the different images to build the anorthal mosaic. Uh, thus, in this case, the algorithm is not modified because full registrations are performed uh, on different nodes and GPUs. In this second uh, case, we have to register pairs of hyperspectral images with large spatial and spectral resolutions. This means expensive uh, registrations uh, in terms of execution time. So in this case, the algorithm uh, was modified as the Parallelism is applied at low level. First, we distribute the images in group of rows, rows and then in principal components. So we got to the fun part of the presentation, something that you can touch and, and play with. 
In this link, uh, you can find a Git repository with a code example. The idea, the idea is that you try to run this code at home. Uh, I mean, not now because we don't have uh, enough time right now. Um, what uh, will you find in this uh, repo? Uh, a version of the hyperspectral Fourier imaging algorithm to register pairs of hyperspectral images in parallel uh, using a GPU cluster. So in this version, uh, the data sets are distributed among the available GPUs on different, uh, on different nodes. It means that each GPU performs a full registration of one data set. The procedure is as follows. The master node reads all the data set from disk. The master node distributes the data set cyclically among the available nodes using MPI. If each node has more than one GPU and has more than one data set to process, each GPU registers a different data set in parallel using OpenMP. And finally, the nodes send the resulting uh, images to the master node. The master node writes them to disk. It's a similar uh, distri data distribution, uh, is similar to the first case. But in the first case, we are uh, registering a multispectral uh, bounds and then uh, uh, images to build an ortho mosaic. It's not the case. We are registering different pairs of hyperspectral images at the same time. So I am finishing. So in short, yeah, we can register different data sets in parallel by distributing them across the different nodes and GPUs. So you are going to need a cluster to run this code. Uh, the supercomputing center of Galicia uh, kindly provides us with a set of user accounts to use their new supercomputer, the Finisterrae 3. If, uh, if any of the 50 students officially accepted in the course want an account to test the code, please send me an email to this address uh, requesting, uh, requesting it along this week. The accounts are valid uh, for one month. As I said, we need to know our cluster. Well, the, the code is prepared that you can run it uh, no, uh, knowing nothing, but it's important to know a bit uh, which is a cluster we are going to use. So this is the Finisterrae 3. The Finisterrae 3 is the, as I said, the Thesgas brand's new supercomputer. It was released uh, three months ago, and it has a total uh, computing power of four petaflops and it consists of more than 300 nodes. There are different kinds of nodes depending on the type of computation that we need. For example, if we need terabytes of memory, we are going to use, we, we need to use a fat node, um, but it is not our case. We need GPUs, so we have to use GPU nodes. The, there are uh, 64 GPUs nodes of this, uh, GPU nodes uh, in the Finisterrae 3, and each node has two GPUs a, a 100. So where should you start? Uh, <laughs> like everything, uh, reading the instructions in the readme file in the repo. Everything you need is listed, is listed there. How to connect to the supercomputer, how to compile the code, how to run it, etc. There are also three examples that you can run without modifying anything. Uh, the first consists in registering three datasets using only one node with one GPU. The second uh, one consists in registering the same three datasets, but, but using three nodes with uh, one uh, GPU per node, I mean three uh, GPUs in total. And the third uh, example consists in registering six datasets using three nodes, but with two GPUs each, I mean in total uh, six GPUs. So I invite you to run uh, the three examples and compare their execution times. In case you want to go into more detail, here is the bi biography. Um, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I will be pleased to answer any questions you, you may have. Thank you. Just in time. Thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. I'm going to share to stop sharing the, the presentation. Yeah, it's done. It's done.
Well, uh, if you have questions, comments, uh, any curiosity or any idea to discuss with, with Alvaro, please feel free or to ask. Anything yeah, you can Alvaro? send me yeah. an email later if you, you prefer, whatever you want. Yeah, or, or using the chat or... Yeah, come, I'm here, please, because we have problems with the microphone and it's, it's better. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So just uh, one question, if you, if you wanted to have more speed up, uh, do you see any ways that uh, you could continue this work? Mm, yeah, depending on the problem, because for example, in the first case, we are not uh, doing a parallelization at lower level. We are only distributing a complete data set in the different nodes and GPUs. So it could be, a, we can carry out a more a low level a parallelizations a, approaches, but um, we have to say that we already have a lot of uh, parallelization levels because we are using uh, at the same time the hundreds of nodes that the GPU has. At the same time, we are using different uh, GPUs and at the same time, we are using different nodes. So we have like three uh, parallelization levels. It could be uh, difficult to accelerate with a higher speed ups more these, these, these codes. So uh, if you if you make the solution more hardware aware, so looking at the warps and at the memory that its warp has, can you maybe uh, parallelize, parallelize better by splitting the data in a in a fashion that utilizes that? If you don't, sorry, I don't uh, hear very well the question. If you don't uh, have a so you have we, less hardware. No, no, no. Uh, being aware of the exact specifications of the hardware that you use. So uh, I guess that the V100 has a different uh, CAS, a different uh, memory per warp. Yep. Uh, and uh, maybe you, can, you could also utilize that to. Yeah, uh, does, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, the important thing uh, when you have different uh, uh, hardware, yeah, when you have a, a homogeneous, a heterogeneous cluster, is to um, to distribute the workload according to the hardware capabilities. So, yeah, in this uh, example, yeah, uh, well, depending on the on the size of the images, but yeah, the big one hundred could do uh, could be could process more uh, images like the, the are that it is processing now. Uh, but uh, I'm talking about this case, this case in, in this one, but uh, because the, this implementation was limited to uh, each GPU can perform one full registration. Uh, so yeah, the B100 is limited because of the other GPUs, because uh, maybe, I mean, I can explain better with this slide, sorry. For example, it's not the case because uh, the three kinds or types of GPUs that uh, we are using uh, has uh, enough memory to store these images. But for example, imagine that the, uh, the, the oldest one uh, uh, that, uh, don't have enough memory to store this. So in this case, we are limiting our problem to the image sizes that all the uh, GPUs can uh, store. So yeah, the B100 could uh, do uh, more. I don't know if I am answering your question. No, no, it's, uh, it's good. I'm, I'm covered. So. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Bye bye. Thank you. Any additional question or comment? One question that arises is when you're presenting the implementation is at what extent uh, the implementation is hardware dependent? 
and how many changes uh, you should make to the code in order to adapt it to a different uh, hardware structure. If you don't uh, want to uh, adapt the code to the uh, to low level, I mean to the specific uh, hardware uh, specifications, uh, you can run it uh, without modifying uh, anything. But if you have, if you want to exploit a new architecture, a new GPU architecture, or a new CPU architecture, yeah, you need to modify it and balance the workloads according to the computing capabilities there there are available in at this moment but if you want you can run it the code uh, without uh, doing anything there is a prepare to execute on the number of gpus that we have available and the user only has to uh, only has to specify the number of nodes that we have but it is uh, mandatory in mpi when you run a code in mpi you have to uh, in specific specify in the command uh, how many nodes you want to use. Mm -hmm. So having a, a good implementation is, is relatively easy. Having the best implementation is not so easy. <laughs> yeah, correct. In exponential, exponentially growing uh, process of programming. I don't know if you have any other question or comment. In in other case, you have here the, the details for contacting Alvaro in case you want to try this code in the supercomputing center of Galicia or any other code using, uh, if I remember well, uh, one node. They have access to, to one node of the of the supercomputer. No, to all the supercomputer. Yeah, to all the supercomputer. Yeah. Ah, we are lucky. They were very generous <laughs> this time, so uh, you have... <laughs> Yeah, not because, yes. <laughs> Take care with the code that you execute because they have a very serious manager, but uh, you can try your codes there if you, if you want. And the access is until the end of the month. So uh, along this week, you can contact Alvaro in case you, you want to, to access the, the center. They have different, obviously, different languages, platforms, and libraries available for for the execution of your codes is in Python or, or any other uh, any other language and for using the GPUs uh, also. Uh, so uh, if you don't have any additional question, we close the session. Um, thank you very much, Alvaro. Thank you. See you again in a couple of days. See you. Bye bye, bye. guys. Bye thank bye. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Garbali. Bye. So I think we can uh, get going, right? So welcome everybody to the afternoon uh, session. Welcome again. So uh, now Marcel and uh, I will present uh, the uh, our work in the context of the Center of Excellence Race, a European project. So I will give the floor to Marcel, uh, who will start with the presentation, and then I will uh, take up the torch later on uh, in the second part of the presentation. So Marcel, please go ahead and let's see if everything is fine. Thank you, Rocco. Um, yeah. Hello to everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Um, I will now just give a brief um, uh, introduction to the race project uh, that Rocco and me both work on um, and I will give a, a short general overview um, and then afterwards uh, Rocco will uh, describe an actual remote sensing use case uh, we have in this project. Um, so just a few words uh, about the two of us. Um, we are both um, PhD students um, working at the Uli Supercomputing Center in Germany um, both under supervision of uh, Professor Morris Riedel, um, because we are both also um, PhD students uh, enrolled uh, at the University of Iceland. And yeah, our research interests uh, are broadly speaking both uh, in the area of uh, large scale machine learning. Uh, the Ulich Supercomputing Center um, 
is part of the uh, Jülich Research Center here in Germany, a, a very big um, uh, research uh, organization here in Germany. And um, we host uh, one of the most super, one of the most powerful supercomputers uh, we have in Europe, um, the Jewels Booster. Uh, you might have uh, heard of the top 500 list uh, yesterday that came out. Um, the fastest one in Europe is now in Finland. Um, but I still, I think we still made something like uh, uh, place 10 or 11. Um, and we also uh, have uh, the first D-Wave quantum annealer uh, in Europe uh, at our site. And um, apart from that, um, also uh, some other smaller supercomputers. But uh, the booster, for example, has more than uh, 3,000 uh, A100 NVIDIA GPUs. So uh, a lot of compute power. Um, just a quick, uh, yeah, motivational introduction uh, for this um, COE race. Um, as you all know, uh, more and more data is uh, collected. And um, uh, by now we actually need AI to analyze these big data sets and to uh, extract knowledge uh, and insights from these data sets that the human eye uh, cannot find. Um, and because these data sets are so big, uh, we need a lot of compute power to do so, which we get from our supercomputers. Um, and hopefully we will be able to get even more uh, compute power from um, the exascale machines that, um, uh, yeah, we, we might get uh, in the future. Um, but of course, um, apart from the hardware, we also need uh, scalable algorithms and libraries to run this uh, yeah, high performance data analytics uh, on the hardware. And this is what we work on in the Center of Excellence uh, RACE. RACE stands for Research on AI and Simulation Based Engineering at Exascale. And uh, what we do is take uh, the so called full loop into account. That means that we um, have uh, experiments or CFD simulations that we run with, uh, for example, classical numerical methods. These um, experiments generate a lot of data and uh, we use this data for our AI models. Um, we analyze it with AI or machine learning models and um, the output of these machine learning models is then again used to uh, improve the original simulation or the original um, uh, yeah, CFD uh, experiment. Uh, on the hardware side, uh, for this, we leverage uh, modular supercomputing, which means uh, that we have different types of hardwares in our supercomputers. These range from uh, classical CPUs uh, to, of course, GPU accelerators, and uh, now even, as I already mentioned, um, also quantum annealers. And um, for each task that we have in the project, we try to find the most suitable hardware to run this task on. For example, CFD simulations uh, work very well on uh, CPUs, while, uh, of course, the training of neural networks uh, is a lot faster on uh, GPUs, generally speaking. The uh, major object objective of RACE is then to um, bundle these me methodologies we developed into a so-called unique AI framework that will then uh, combine all the insights uh, we got, for example, uh, from which software to use uh, on which hardware. Uh, and we do so with lots of partners from all across Europe. Um, uh, of course, University of Iceland is also one partner, um, but also uh, partners in France, in Spain, uh, in Cyprus, in the Netherlands. Uh, so yeah, a very big uh, European project. Um, and we also <clears throat> do so uh, in different uh, application use cases to make sure that the methods that uh, we develop um, are actually applicable to yeah, real world uh, problems, let's say. And um, these use cases are split into two kinds. Um, on the one hand, we have these compute-driven use cases, which, for example, are the CFD experiments where a lot of data is generated uh, 
from simulations or experiments. And on the other side, we have these data-driven use cases where we have a lot of data already available. Uh, for example, the um, satellite data in uh, remote sensing, and Rocco will now uh, introduce this remote sensing use case. Yeah, so from now on, I will take over. Thanks, uh, Marcel, for changing the slide. So uh, basically, with uh, uh, Dr. Cavallaro, we are working on uh, this issue that I'm presenting now. Uh, so this, the problem that we are facing is that uh, um, basically the land cover uh, maps of Europe are produced every some years by European uh, agencies at continental level, but the update of these maps is not really, uh, is not really uh, frequent because it requires people uh, to basically validate that um, that data, so the labels on the ground. And so our idea, uh, as other people in research uh, had, is to use some other approach to uh, help in the uh, update of these uh, land cover uh, on, on these uh, land cover labels, and to do so with land cover classification. Um, basically, what uh, we would like to do is to acquire, to use, uh, make use of uh, long time series of uh, data acquired by satellites, namely Sentinel-2 for our uh, use case, and to uh, use some deep learning or machine learning algorithm in general to see if we can actually uh, extract some information from these time series of data and uh, update the uh, land cover maps more frequently than just uh, every uh, six years as it happens for the Corine map, which is one of the most widely used uh, for the uh, European continent. Um, so uh, Marcel, if you can maybe switch to the next uh, uh, slide. Thank you very much. So this is just a draft of uh, one uh, of the idea that we that we have in mind that, that we are implementing, which is an adaptation of a code that uh, our partner in the Netherlands and in Trento, Claudia Paris and Professor Bruzzone uh, have been developing over the years. And now we are adding our contribution to it in the porting of the application onto an HPC uh, system. So basically, uh, we start off with the uh, Corine um, maps uh, and also with the long time series of Sentinel-2 data, as I was saying. Basically, we apply some uh, pre-processing to the uh, Sentinel-2 uh, images uh, and we apply also some clustering to try to understand which are the most reliable samples uh, in our uh, image so that we that, so that they belong with a high likelihood to uh, some specific class of land cover and then from there we uh, create a sort of uh, training set that we then feed into um, machine learning methods and that is the part where i am uh, mostly contributing uh, in the context of uh, the uh, center of excellence race. So if we can go on to uh, the next, just to give you an idea on the uh, left, yeah, on the left, you will see the uh, one example of for a tile. Uh, on the left, you will see the Corine map of, uh, of this tile, which is, uh, which covers Trentino in the region of Trenton in, uh, in Northern Italy, so in the Alps. Uh, and uh, on the right, we compare it to uh, a predicted map with uh, the method that we have been using, uh, which is uh, a, a simple random forest in this case. Uh, but I have to say that then uh, we we also uh, adopted other uh, techniques on top. So basically now we are working mostly uh, with uh, LSTMs instead, and also now entering, well, starting to, to work also with uh, transformers, uh, because uh, we would like, as I was saying, to use uh, the uh, longest uh, time series is that, that we can uh, that when compared to the random forest, which uh, per se uh, obviously uh, cannot, uh, is not meant to deal with long time series by itself. So um, if, if we go on with the uh, next, which is also my last slide here for now. Um, so as I was saying, this is a framework that we have been adapting and was working mainly, as I was showing, on a restricted area. 
but uh, we are trying to extend it at least at a national level and then we hope to extend it to a continental uh, level at the level of Europe, the whole Europe. And uh, this, uh, this slide uh, would show for the, tens, for the 10 uh, tiles of the Netherlands, uh, the 10 tiles of Sentinel-2 for the Netherlands, uh, what is the amount of data that we are dealing with? So uh, in total, for the three years, 2018, 2019, and 2020, we are talking about more or less 600 gigabytes. Um, and obviously, if we uh, extend these at a continental level, that would be definitely uh, much more than that. And so that's why uh, we uh, think that it was uh, a good timing uh, to move on to an HPC facility. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have been able to even think of this uh, application. Uh, so yeah, this is the work that I'm, uh, I'm developing right now with, uh, with uh, Dr. Cavallaro and the other partners, uh, as I was mentioning. Um, and uh, my contribution here uh, lays mainly in the, uh, in the adoption of trying to adopt more advanced uh, deep learning techniques than uh, the uh, simpler uh, and more basic um, techniques, machine learning techniques that were used before, and to see if we can actually improve uh, on uh, and deliver a product that uh, makes sense also from the point of view of the uh, predicted labels, actually. So that the, um, the land cover maps that we uh, give as output uh, are actually consistent what what is expected so this i think is going to be a very interesting work and we are investing uh, our time here uh, for the uh, next few months and possibly years till the project is over so marcel uh, i think that uh, the slides are over right uh, yeah yes. so yeah okay so i was right so uh, marcel would then come back i think after uh three and a half, four maybe, uh, because there will be the, the coffee break first, but then, so before he, he, we have the coffee break, there will be my presentation, which will take more or less the next hour. Um, so from now on, you, I think you can switch off the, uh, your share, the screen, and then I can go on with mine. Let's see. Let's see. Control L should work. Yes. Okay. Nice. So um, that was an introduction to what this uh, COE Center of Excellence uh, race is. But I uh, so the um, the lecture now is intended to give you an introduction, uh, not just to our project and applications but also to some foundations of uh, distributed deep learning. So um, basically uh, to do so, I should start off with some recap of basic concepts of uh, what deep learning is, and also some other concepts that relate more to the uh, high performance computing uh, and what it is and what it entails. Uh, also, I will have to, to go very briefly uh, over the uh, communication backends that are used by the uh, algorithms that are currently uh, adopted for uh, distributed deep learning. Uh, I will also present some of these, uh, well, mostly one of these frameworks, which is Horovod, that is very widely used uh, now. And uh, then I will try to sum up a little bit and give my, uh, my thoughts uh, on, on that, on this topic. So um, as I was saying, I'll start with some uh, recap of uh, some of the most basic and important concepts of deep learning that are really important for me to then expand on this and go on with the distributed part. And so what we're going to see is, um, again, what, is, uh, what are these terms that I'm going to use also later on. So what is uh, the, the loss, so uh, what are we doing, so what is training. So basically, provided that we have a, a model uh, so that we have a function um, and that we have a function defined uh, you know, on its own, with its own set of parameters, we want to uh, train it on uh, the data that we have available. So basically, we also call this training uh, the fitting of the model on the data that we have. So the fitting of the model is basically 
the optimization, the, the, the finding of the, of the right, of the best uh, parameters of the model in order to, um, to fit the uh, model on uh, the data that are available. So um, we can say that basically the uh, loss is uh, a uh, way, is a measure actually of the, uh, that tells us how much the uh, model is good. So it's fitting the data or it is not fitting the data. So maybe it's fitting it even either too much. So with uh, overfitting or uh, is not capturing the pattern, uh, the pattern in our training uh, data. So um, that said, so the second concept that brings me uh, there is what happens. Uh, so what we are doing is that we are training our model on uh, a subset of the total uh, available data that uh, we uh, have. So we, uh, we can say that in general, we, we can split the uh, data set into two disjoint uh, subsets that, is, that are the training and the test um, data. Uh, so that you uh, you train the uh, model on the uh, training subset, uh, as the name suggests, and then you uh, basically compute some metrics to to see uh, what the loss is on the unseen test data uh, and what the metrics are. So to understand how good is your uh, model on data that it has not seen during the training, and we call the let's say the capability uh, the ability of the model to uh, to to work well on these unseen data uh, as uh, generalization and so uh, if generalization is good then our model is is able to be used on other data that is not being used uh, during the training and if it is bad it means that uh, we cannot uh, definitely uh, transfer our, well, use our model in prediction. And so this is a very important uh, concept in general for, for deep learning, obviously, but it's crucially important in distributed deep learning, uh, as we will see later, because uh, distributed deep learning uh, can actually, uh, comes with this uh, drawback that it might uh, make the, uh, uh, reaching a good generalization more uh, difficult actually than uh, without using distributed uh, deep learning uh, approaches. So this is a concept that is going to be uh, very important in my talk later on. That's why I wanted to really uh, talk uh, to really introduce a little bit about it before we go on. So um, the second thing that I would like to introduce before uh, we, we, we go on uh, is um, more related to, instead of deep learning itself, it's more related to the hardware that we are using. So basically the uh, supercomputers that, uh, that we use. So basically um, you will see that you should know that supercomputers are built with uh, more uh, basic building blocks, let's say, and the important concepts that stays uh, behind these, uh, the foundations of it, are the concepts of uh, shared memory and uh, distributed memory. So basically shared memory where the processors can uh, access, uh, uh, let's say a unique address, uh, um, a unique space of addresses more correctly in memory. Uh, and uh, while on the other hand, uh, we uh, have the, um, the shared the distributed memory uh, approach where uh, we actually uh, each processor uh, has its access to its own uh, memory. So uh, basically what happens is, if we see the next slide, that uh, supercomputers are uh, basically uh, uh, um, an ensemble, a system of uh, multiple nodes. Uh, each of these nodes uh, can be thought uh, as a uh, um, uh, shared uh, memory uh, computer in a way, if you wish so. Uh, and uh, uh, then these uh, nodes are interconnected between them with some uh, high-speed uh, interconnection, like for example, can be Ethernet or uh, InfiniBand, uh, most likely uh, for really faster uh, communication. Uh, and so uh, we, in a way, um, in, a, in a supercomputer are in the position of being uh, of having a sort of hybrid system that inside the node has uh, shared uh, memory uh, processors uh, and uh, outside, so outside the node, if you look at the whole system, 
erase uh, it is uh, a distributed um, a distributed memory um, so um, yeah basically um, I would say that uh, yeah I, I left this picture here for you also with some reference if you want to look at the again at the uh, supercomputer the yeah, the Jewels booster that Marcel was talking about earlier so our uh, let's say spare head of uh, of Yulish. Uh, and uh, that said, um, so I will um, go on with another uh, with some other concepts that relate very uh, closely with uh, what I've been talking now. So uh, the uh, the distributed memory uh, systems. So basically, as I was saying, the in the distributed memory uh, systems, you have somehow to interconnect the the various uh, processors. And basically, uh, it is done so in the in the um, with some uh, some sort of uh, some sort of libraries. Uh, let's say, um, I would say the most uh, widely used is uh, MPI, uh, which is uh, a standard. Actually, not not exactly a library, but rather a standard, meaning that there are multiple implementations of. Uh, this standard, for example, there is the Open MPI, but also the the Intel implementation, Parastation MPI. You can find many different implementations of of this standard. But what is important here, uh, beside this, is that uh, these standards basically defines some uh, ways of communicating between uh, the processors in a uh, distributed memory system. So um, there are simple operations that can be performed. Uh, for example, point-to-point -point operations, uh, but you can build on top of it and even implement, uh, for example, with more advanced functions, uh, you can uh, also implement uh, not just point-to-point -point and broadcast operations, but also your own uh, topologies that you like here. For example, you can see uh, an example of a ring, of a, of a wheel, you can implement a star where, for example, you have a master and then the workers, so you can really play around with it uh, and uh, and define uh, your own uh, way, your own shape, let's say. And why it is important in uh, the, 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 the reason why this is very important for distributed deep learning is because again, in HPC, as we were saying, we have these uh, distributed uh, memory systems and with distributed deep learning, what we want to do is to train uh, in a, in a way synchronously or, or asynchronously, but we want to train these models using multiple resources. And so to do so, we need some way of communicating between these processors. And MPI is, uh, comes uh, at our aid here. Uh, so of this figure here, a very important uh, topology that is uh, very, uh, very useful in, uh, in our case is the ring, so the central one, because uh, as you will see later, uh, Horovod actually uh, utilizes it to uh, exchange the gradients among uh, the uh, different workers. So uh, that's why I put this figure here in this slide. Um, so obviously there is much more to MPI than, than this. There are uh, a lot of operations that I'm not entering into uh, detail and I won't explain now. Uh, but again, as I was saying, this is a very important building block of every uh, application that deals with distributed deep learning. And in general, I would say with any scientific application uh, on uh, distributed uh, learning, also simulations. So obviously they use, uh, they rely heavily on MPI. So um, that said, um, People, uh, especially in the industry at NVIDIA, uh, which was, uh, is still the leader uh, in the uh, GPUs, uh, in the GPU markets for scientific computing, uh, came up with some, let's say, more optimized um, algorithms, more optimized libraries for uh, their uh, hardware. And uh, uh, Basically, you know, they, they thought that uh, they might have improved and they actually could improve on the results provided, on the performances provided by MPI. So basically, NCCL or NICL, uh, as you wish to call, um, re-implements the uh, collective operations uh, that are 
uh, defined by MPI in a way that uh, they are uh, more efficient on the GPU uh, devices of NVIDIA. Um, I have put here actually a, a figure that is actually of some years ago as they still, uh, it's, they still show the results of the uh, V100 that is now two generations old after because then after also the, the, they came the A100 that now the new H100, the new architecture at four nanometers. Uh, but still, uh, what they were showing here is that uh, using a smart combination of their library and uh, 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 their own specific uh, switches, which are the MVLink, uh, they could create these islands of, um, of GPUs that are uh, for intranode actual communication uh, that were really, uh, really much faster than a peripheral uh, component. Uh, interconnection, the PCI. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, this is something uh, really important, not only uh, for intranode, which is the example you see here, but also in the case of, uh, uh, of internode, so of uh, distributed uh, memory system, uh, because this library is also optimized to uh, work with, uh, on top of InfiniBand, for example, uh, when InfiniBand uh, is used to uh, interconnect multiple nodes of our uh, HPC. Uh, HPC system. Um, yeah, I anyway put the link there if you want to, to see more. There is this nice uh, blog uh, article on uh, that that benchmarks a little bit, uh, shows some benchmarks of NCCL. Uh, but there is also now another, uh, another library that is a sort of AMD version of uh, Nicol, which is called Recol RCCL. And uh, um, uh, basically, they um, sort of re-implemented, so reuse uh, the actually more correctly. They didn't re-implement; they reused the kernel uh, that was written uh, in uh, C. Uh, and uh, basically, um, they did it so that their claim is that even if you have an older NCCL code from uh, actually uh, that was. Uh, optimized to work with NVIDIA, you should be able to run on their new uh, Radeon Instinct uh, um, hardware as well. And in fact, uh, in the latest year, after the yeah, many years of uh, uh, domain, let's say, of, of, um, of the, uh, that the market was basically almost in the hands of NVIDIA, uh, AMD uh, has been selling his hardware uh, to many uh, supercomputers. So here I've put some example. There is, uh, I think two years ago, the, in Barcelona, they created a prototype using AMD, um, AMD GPUs. Then came Lumi that Marcel was also citing in Finland, which is now the, the most uh, uh, famous supercomputer, well, the most potent, powerful supercomputer in, in Europe and famous because it entered the, the top uh, 500. Uh, and it's also using uh, the, the new AMD GPUs. But also the new supercomputer that yesterday was brought into the news uh, in Oak Ridge, which is now the first exascale supercomputer, is using AMD uh, GPUs. So uh, I think it's going to be interesting. We are entering this phase of, I would say, uh, maturity of, of this technology at this, technology of this point. So other players also, uh, IBM is trying to enter this market. Let's see what will happen. And then over the next few years, I'm really curious to see. So that said, uh, I was saying that provided that you use uh, the uh, hardware uh, by NVIDIA, um, there are these, there is this uh, library which is uh, well optimized for for it. And basically, I wanted also to to report this uh, figure here that compares. Uh, the performances of uh, the, of some codes, of some deep learning code for uh, with, uh, and they, they evaluate the basically the performance uh, in terms of communication time um, uh, for a different number of uh, of devices, of workers, of GPUs, and basically what you should see here is that the communication time is lower uh, when you use the, their own, let's say, uh, library and CCL on the NVIDIA devices when compared to using uh, an MPI implementation. And they also compare it here with Glue, which is yet another, um, yet another backend that can be uh, used. 
And again, I left the, um, the reference here because it might be also interesting to see that, for example, in the figures below, the difference is not so high when you use small tensors, uh, but then it should increase when you use very large tensors, um, at least uh, from what I recall. So, so, I mean, one could have a look at it and it's, it's, it might be interesting also depending on your application to understand whether it makes sense to use uh, one or the other. Um, but I mean, if possible, obviously, their own NCCL uh, should work better. So um, after this uh, introduction uh, of, the, uh, of the basics of deep learning, of the basics of HPC and, and, and of the backends that are used by these algorithms, I would like to provide a motivation to explain why uh, what I'm talking about here today uh, makes sense as is actually an important topic and is worth studying as uh, many of us are doing uh, in Yulish and all around the world. And basically the reason is that if you look at the uh, figures that report the dimension uh, in number, in terms of number of parameters of deep learning models over the last decade, you can clearly see that the growth is uh, uh, old. Actually, it's, it's exponential because if you look at the figure on the top uh, left, uh, no, sorry, yeah, on the top right here, yeah, uh, you see that it's, it looks almost linear, but the, the scale actually is in log. So actually, it's a very, very fast uh, uh, growth in, uh, in terms of uh, the, the size of these models. So, um, in recent years, most of the growth was driven by these very large, huge uh, language models uh, created by these companies, by OpenAI, by NVIDIA, by Microsoft, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, you can see that I here reported a figure from 2020, and there, two years ago, we were reaching basically the 10 billion uh, parameters. And now, if you look uh, just uh, uh, two years afterwards, you can see that we are almost reaching and pretty soon, uh, actually already reached uh, the uh, 1,000 billion uh, parameters, which is uh, really, uh, really huge. Uh, and I will also um, present something interesting on, on actually fun, on, on the training of these uh, models later on at the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, because, I mean, as you can see, uh, well, if you look at the uh, who is the, the developer of these models, most likely 90% of them are by companies, industry, um, also because the resources that are required to train these huge models are really uh, impressive. So you really need to spend a, a really huge uh, computational budget to train these monsters. So um, the, uh, this brings me to this uh, second follow-up slide. That is, okay, we, people have developed these models, but how can you actually train these huge models in a reasonable amount of time, provided that you have enough resources? So basically, again, you can uh, distribute your model on multiple uh, devices. So um, here there are some more uh, images that, uh, uh, describe a bit what uh, what happens and why the reason why um, people have been actually increasing the size of their models and so basically here there are there is the test loss uh, which is reported alongside with the number of uh, parameters of the of the models and what can be seen is that actually the generalization uh, capability so again the, the the capability of the model of being used on unseen data uh, increase uh, with the, um, the, generalization, the generalization capability increase with the number of parameters of the model, so with the size of the model. Uh, and, but uh, if you use a larger model, in order to be able to train it, you also have to increase the, um, the amount of data that you're using for your training. So the two things are uh, pretty much uh, intertwined in a way, and in fact, that's that's why over the, the last years, uh, um, the, yeah, the, the, the size of these data sets has been uh, increasing uh, tremendously. Obviously, you can clearly see it for text language uh, models, 
but uh, also if you look at the famous uh, image net but all, for us also in the remote sensing community the for example the big earth net data set they, they they have become the 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 benchmark let's say with more than uh, half a million uh, images so uh, this is a common trend so it's true uh, for sure language models are are ahead uh, compared to the image models for in terms of size and data that is used but uh, still a lot is, is really uh, going on and the, the, the frontier is very, very fast paced. So watch out. And um, yeah, I also here left a, an interesting reference that explains also the how much intertwined the data set size and the size of the model uh, are. Uh, because actually, yeah, researchers have also been studying how much you must increase uh, the amount of data that you use compared uh, to uh, the uh, size of the model that you decide to use. And here, in fact, there is this paper, uh, which is on the scaling laws for uh, neural, for natural language um, models uh, from uh, Kaplan, which is uh, from uh, a researcher at uh, John Hopkins and OpenAI, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, try to read uh, it if you're interested. So that said, Mm, we see that the, the size of these models has been growing uh, consistently uh, over time. And so that it makes sense actually mm, that we need to, to, to somehow speed up, uh, scale uh, the training of these models uh, in order to be able to, to, to have them, to, to get them in a reasonable amount of time, as I was saying. But how do uh, we actually do it? So basically, there are two main families, I would say, of approaches to uh, scaling the training uh, of a deep learning model. Uh, the first being data parallelism and the second model parallelism. So data parallelism is till now, till some, well, till now, yes, I would say, still the most, um, the most used. Because in a way, it's also uh, simpler from, uh, from the point of view of the implementation. And it, uh, uh, it basically boils down to, to this. So uh, provided that you have your uh, resources, so for example, multiple GPUs available on your system, uh, you split the training data that you have and you feed uh, chunks, so a different chunk of data to uh, different workers, so to different devices. Uh, each device will sort of uh, keep, uh, uh, will train uh, computer gradients locally, but then at some point, the, uh, the local gradients must be exchanged in order to retrieve, to compute a global uh, average gradient so that you keep uh, the model uh, training consistent among all the replicas uh, that you have. But basically it is as if you were training the same model uh, over and over on multiple devices in parallel on different chunks of the input training uh, data. So uh, as I was saying, this is the still the, the most uh, used approach. There are now many frameworks implementing this uh, concept. Um, and, uh, for example, also uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch have their own uh, built-in um, their own, their own built strategy to do so. But this is the first family. There is also a second family that has gained traction throughout the, uh, the years, and most recently thanks to the advances uh, of uh, Microsoft with their uh, deep speed uh, framework, which is called model parallelism. So model parallelism, instead of distributing the data, uh, takes care of distributing the model itself. So mm, there are actually multiple ways of deciding how to partition, how to, to distribute your model among the devices that you have. Uh, but mainly, again, we have two, uh, two approaches here uh, again. So, the first one is pipelining. So uh, let's think about your the, the depth of your uh, of your model. So how many uh, layers your model uh, has, and you can basically um, you can basically split your uh, your model in the dimension of the depth. 
and, and send, let's say, uh, uh, a group, group, group up uh, some, um, some of these layers and send this group of layers to one uh, specific uh, device. And, and basically uh, each device, each GPU device would end up with a different part uh, of the model. But as you might, if you think about it a little bit, obviously this increases quite uh, significantly the complexity because you have to define somehow how these uh, different parts of the model are uh, interconnected. Um, so in general, model parallelism entailed much more, uh, let's say much, it was much more handcrafted uh, than, uh, than it was data parallelism, which was much more straightforward. But as I was saying, things are now changing. So also this is a topic that is uh, now, uh, now has gained again uh, quite some popularity and is being democratized. So, so I think it's also very interesting to study this. And uh, here, um, yeah, relating to, to this pipelining concept, we can see uh, on the uh, right, uh, this the figure where you see a simpler vanilla approach, let's say on top, which is basically um, an approach where uh, each device has to wait for the computation, uh, let's say that happens in that first group of, on the on the previous group of layers before being able to uh, compute uh, their own operations, its own operations on on uh, on on the on the current device, let's say, and passing it over and it over to the next device. But obviously, this is a very simple and, and vanilla approach, and there are uh, more let's say uh, better better ways than the uh, more advanced ways than the naive approach uh, using, for example, a sort of pipelining not only of the layers, but also of the input data so that you keep your, uh, your devices um, not idle, so busy as much as you can instead of wasting uh, a lot of uh, computational time as, this, as would happen in the top figure uh, that you can see. So, uh, so it's very important to, to know that actually uh, there are also advanced approaches that are uh, pipelining in a double fold uh, sense. But also there is another uh, way of dealing with uh, model parallelism, which is called uh, tensor uh, parallelism. So rather than, uh, let's say, splitting um, the models in, in terms of depth, you can also uh, take advantage of, uh, the, of some algebraic uh, operations uh, with uh, matrices. Uh, and basically split up these uh, operations uh, and, and compute them on different devices at the same time so that you can basically reduce the uh, amount of uh, memory that is required to, to, to empower, that is required to compute these uh, operations. And you can then uh, increase the size of the model that you can train, that you're able to train. And this is a very important form of parallelism because um, this uh, really um, was uh, is a concept on which the the recent uh, uh, surge of um, of uh, transformers is based on, and so uh, so these huge models uh, that are that we have seen like GPT uh, that is trained on billion parameters basically they uh, they use this attention self attention uh, concept. Uh, and they are scaled up and their, their power when it, comparing them to the LSTMs is that while LSTM has this intrinsic, uh, let's say, uh, sequence nature to them, uh, transformers can actually uh, see that the data in a way at the same time can be split in a much more efficient way than LSTMs. So that's, that is uh, what drove the, uh, the actually the, the, the uh, the growth uh, in size of the models that we have seen in the figures some slides uh, before. So this is a very uh, interesting uh, approach. And in fact, I also put here another link, uh, let's say more pop than some, uh, because it's explained actually by Yannick Kircher, but it's, uh, it's, really, it's really interesting and well done. So if you have some time, also look at it because it will enter into the details of the, of the concept that is that stays behind the uh, the transformers and so these very big uh, models that we were uh, talking about. So, but uh, unfortunately, uh, despite being very powerful tools, 
researchers over time have noticed that the adoption of uh, distributed deep learning is, I mean, it comes at some cost. And basically, um, it's not so, uh, it just doesn't scale as inf infinitely without a limit. And so uh, people have started to see that this limit is reached pretty soon. Um, and basically what happens is the following. So in deep learning, you know that you, you train your model um, using a batch size. Uh, and when you train your model on, let's say on multiple devices, basically the real batch size, the effective batch size, or if you want to call it the global batch size, is the uh, product between the number of uh, processors that you're using of workers and the local batch size for each uh, of these workers. So actually you end up with a, a much larger effective batch size, a real batch size than the original one in the simpler uh, single uh, GPU case, let's say. And uh, uh, unfortunately what happens is that the generalization capability of the model decreases uh, pretty soon. And depending on the data set and on the model, more or less this happens around a batch size, a global batch size of 8,000 samples. And as you can see on the top uh, left, uh, no, on the top right, uh, yeah, on the top right figure, um, basically, the, the, the time to convergence, the, to convergence or the number of steps to convergence of the model at some point start, uh, starts to diverge from the ideal uh, case, the, that line. And basically, at some point, really uh, not only uh, diverges, but just uh, saturates. So, uh, so people have been noticing this uh, pretty soon. And um, they have been trying to understand the, the, the reasons why, so from a scientific uh, point of view. Uh, many people actually found out that some researchers had, uh, had studied and uh, discussed this issue many, uh, well, quite some time ago. Uh, one of them who gave an explanation of this phenomenon uh, is uh, actually Jürgen Schmittube uh, of the uh, Supercomputing Center of Lugano in the Italian speaking uh, Switzerland. Uh, and uh, um, it's, uh, it's, there, is, there are some papers by him and by other people who follow these uh, uh, footsteps that uh, explain that basically what happens is that um, the loss function as the batch size increases uh, becomes uh, uh, in a way, less flat, so it has much sharper uh, valleys, let's say. And so what happens is that during training, you might end up with a model that is very well optimized, uh, but uh, uh, just for the data that is seen during training. So it ends up in one of those very narrow uh, valleys and uh, cannot really um, extend uh, well and generalize well on test uh, data. So there is, I mean, this, this reason, and it's pretty well established now that this is happening, but the how to solve this took some more time, uh, how to tackle this issue took some more time, and it entails different technical solutions. Um, so I will list some here. Yeah, uh, some here. So basically, as I was saying, this happens most of the times at a batch size of around 8,000 samples, but can sometimes happen even before if the data set is more complex, for example. And in those cases, maybe just a proper scaling of the learning rate and the adoption of a warm up might help stabi stabilizing a little bit the training and also uh, help uh, avoiding issues like the gradient explosion and then uh, hindering uh, without hindering the. Uh, generalization capabilities of the model. But as I was saying, it's not just that, there is really a theoretical problem at the basis. So that's why when the best size really becomes larger, um, you have to adopt more advanced uh, methods and most of them actually are some sort of re-adaptation, re-implementation of uh, um, other well-established uh, optimizers. Uh, one of them, for example, that I listed here uh, is the LARS optimizer that is an adapter, uh, adaptive optimizer that adapts layer-wise the learning rate, uh, basically scaling by um, the norm uh, of the weights for each layer of the model. Uh, and uh, it's based on the vanilla stochastic gradient descent, so SGD, 
uh, but again, it adds this uh, adaptive mechanism in order to make it more uh, effective when using uh, larger batch sizes. And another uh, optimizer that is rather similar in a way is LAMB, which is also an adaptive, layer-wise adaptive optimizer, but rather than being used, um, uh, rather than use uh, SGD as a base algorithm, it uses uh, ADAM. So it is a sort of double degree of uh, adaptation of the learning rate. But also I have to say that there are other, um, other um, optimizers that have been used throughout time. And now also there's a lot of hype on uh, sort of other implementations of SGD as post-local SGD. And there is uh, much more to it. And, uh, but here, yeah, I reported uh, um, uh, some results that come from uh, uh, basically from um, a paper of 2020, uh, where basically you see uh, that uh, now it is possible with the adoption of these optimizers to uh, train models uh, with batch sizes that are much larger than the uh, 8,000 uh, threshold that was uh, the limit till some time ago. So, I mean, things uh, keep moving. And uh, it's still an open research topic. I think it's really interesting also for myself to, to spend some time studying this because that's not uh, uh, all in the sense that, uh, as I was saying, many some people tried to implement new optimizers, but some others thought, okay, but uh, is, it, is the optimizer the real problem? Isn't there something uh, different that we might try out? And in fact, they actually, some other researchers um, perform a sort of reality check of the, of the new optimizers and found out that actually if you spend enough time, enough resources to uh, really tune the hyperparameters of the optimizers and of the model in general, so the learning rate, the use of the momentum and so on, uh, you actually can match and even exceed the uh, benchmark the results by the new optimizer. So still researchers are discussing and investigating on this, this issue. So, uh, so, I mean, one can really try out many different solutions, but the good news is that uh, at least we now know that we can scale our models on uh, much uh, with much larger uh, batch sizes. That is very important. Otherwise uh, we wouldn't be able to train modeled in parallel, basically, uh, because uh, this is a natural consequence. The increase in batch size is a natural consequence on, uh, of the increased number of devices that we want to train our models on. So, um, okay, that was more, uh, that related more to, let's say, the uh, sort of introduction of why we need uh, distributed deep learning and what are the, the two families? I was, I was saying the data parallelism and the, and the model parallelism approach. But actually, the, really, if you have your own code in Python, let's say, how can you uh, scale it uh, on uh, multiple GPUs? That's uh, uh, sort of uh, another story. And so we have to, to, to see, to check uh, what are the solutions that are provided by, uh, by researchers and uh, also industry. Um, um, to to tackle these uh, these uh, the, actually to, to enable data paral uh, data parallelism mainly, uh, but also now as I was saying also model parallelism. So uh, one of the most uh, uh, well the, the most used to, to now to at least to my knowledge uh, approach or framework is the Horovod library. There is a library developed by Uber Engineering, so the one of the the taxi service, let's say. Uh, and um, basically they developed this um, uh, algorithm some uh, years ago um, with, uh, with the intention of getting rid of a central parameter server that was a single point of failure in a way, uh, and instead have a more decentralized approach that was also more robust uh, against, uh, uh, let's say, the loss of some of the worker, for example. Uh, and uh, yeah, so basically um, Horovod is, uses very uh, well-known uh, well backends uh, and two of them are, for example, those that I presented before. So uh, MPI and also uh, Nicol, so the NVIDIA Collective uh, Communication uh, Library for if you're using NVIDIA devices. And the really interesting um, 
good point of I mean the positive point of uh, of horror is that it can work on top of basically all the most important deep learning frameworks that uh, are used now so TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Keras on top of TensorFlow so also Apache MaxNet on cloud so it's really very flexible and uh, yeah they claim that actually with only seven lines of code you are able to scale your uh, your model uh, so provided that you have your already your model written in PyTorch you can scale it with Horvath with just seven additional lines of code in my experience this is true uh, but uh, you, you still have to take care of the data so the distribution of the data you still have to do it by yourself so it might add uh, a layer of complexity depending on how your data look like because you have to do it by yourself but then Horvath takes care of the most important part that is the exchange of the gradients and the synchronization of the models during training so that's uh, that's a very uh, good aspect of it but then uh, sometime later also tensorflow and pytorch follow with uh, with some with their own let's say uh, built-in uh, strategy for data uh, distributed uh, for data distribution and so basically now you could also use the 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 software that is already available uh, with uh, the, the with those libraries without relying on uh, let's say third party uh, libraries um, and so i mean that's in the end honestly now uh, really boils down to your preference to your taste your own taste because performance is since they rely all on the same algorithms and on the same communication backends performances are really really similar so we entered a phase of uh, maturity of this uh, of this solution i would say in in my opinion at least uh, but still horovo provides some uh, some newer interesting features one of them being the integration integration with the uh, rate tune for hyperparameter tuning about which uh, anyway marcel uh, will spend some time later but uh, let's say digging a little bit not too much but just a little bit uh, more into the details of what horovod uh, does and how it implements data parallelism basically it uses the ring so that topology that we had seen before in the mpi slide in order to uh, basically exchange the gradients the local gradients of uh, that are computed by each replica of the model on each gpu exchange the gradient uh, basically sum it up with uh, with this operation that is uh, called reduce operation in the nomenclature of mpi uh, and end up with uh, a global let's say a global averaged or summed up weighted gradient from the original uh, from the original local gradients that we had on each of the gpus so um, basically with this approach, uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, which is an approach that is decentralized, they could get rid of, uh, um, of one single parameter servers that in earlier strategies uh, basically uh, had the, um, so had the, 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 uh, the role of collecting all the gradients and then sending them back. And obviously, this increased significantly the um, the amount of communication that these central parameter servers had to deal with, meaning that you basically ended up with um, one of the, the the workers of your system that was definitely overloaded uh, by by communication. Uh, and in this way, with the ring or reduce approach that was uh, used first by Horovod. Uh, for distributed deep learning, um, basically they got rid of this uh, this problem of a, of a worker that was overloaded by communication, and they distributed it in an efficient way. So uh, instead of being able to stop at just some uh, GPU, you can now scale up to really hundred and thousand of GPUs without uh, seeing. Uh, um, a significant decrease in the performances as long as you have enough data to train your model on, obviously. Uh, but I think that this is a, a very, uh, very interesting uh, figure. And also, I suggest you again uh, to have a look at the YouTube video that I put here. And there's the link to the presentation by engineers at Uber, um, because yeah, you, you can really go through the uh, life cycle of each of these bricks. 
uh, in this figure uh, that basically are again the, the gradients and how you you basically exchange them with the MPI operations. So the the, the broadcasting actually the, 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 yeah the broadcasting of these uh, of these uh, gradients and then the reduced part which is the averaging of the uh, gradients in order to keep the models consistent on each GPU. So again, if you have time and you're interested, look also at the YouTube uh, video. So uh, that said, uh, it's not only uh, Horobot, it's not only the built-in solutions of PyTorch uh, and the TensorFlow. There are even, uh, let's say, much, uh, I mean, more, there's, there's much more to it. And it's a really, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a landscape that has been, be, has been very dynamic over uh, recent years. Uh, for example, there is uh, the HIT uh, Helmholtz Analytics tool, a toolkit that also provides uh, uh, its own way of distributing the tensors. Uh, so it's also developed by people at Julisch and the TIT in, uh, in Germany, so by members of the Helmholtz Association. Uh, but there is also, pardon my Italian accent, Tarantella, uh, which is also developed, by the way, in Germany. Um, uh, but and it, this works uh, specifically with TensorFlow. I don't think it works with PyTorch. Uh, this is from, let's say, the side of researchers. But uh, as I was saying, a lot is now coming uh, out from the uh, uh, straight out from the industry. Uh, so not only all of it, which was developed by Uber, but also here you can see a table that was extracted from a paper by Nvidia uh, that trained the, the Megatron LM, so a very huge transformer. Uh, and it's, it has its own, let's say, implementation of, the, of a model distributed approach using PyTorch, but also, uh, well, there is Colossal AI, which is yet another, but also there is DeepSpeed, so this other uh, figure here, uh, and DeepSpeed uh, has actually been developed and released now two years ago, I think, by Microsoft, uh, and uh, DeepSpeed delivers actually the uh, the capability of not only doing model parallelism, but a mixture of different kinds of parallelism and do it with a lightweight, relatively simple API on top of PyTorch. Uh, meaning that uh, uh, they really managed to democratize the access to larger models, even to people who have not the, the, the availability of uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, GPUs. I mean, obviously still uh, training those models would take some time, but at least you can uh, hope to load them onto your GPUs. And so, which is already something, obviously. So, um, so yeah, again, this is a very uh, dynamic and fast uh, uh, world. So, I mean, also as a researcher, you, you might, miss some of what is going on but it's always really interesting uh, for people to to look at what is going on because uh, yeah there's really really a lot to it and each of these frameworks has its own flavor so might actually provide uh, you with the best solution for your problem but in general uh, as i have to say that with horovod uh, horovod has become very stable and so in recent years i've been uh, using that uh, quite often uh, successfully without too many issues now. So um, I already talked about uh, one of the uh, use cases. Well, the, the use case, the remote sensing land cover classification use case that uh, we are working on uh, in the context uh, of the center of excellence uh, uh, race, so this European project. But actually uh, we have also been running for a longer time, uh, three years and a half now, um, what is now well, much more well-established uh, remote sensing application that we have, uh, which we developed. And basically it's, uh, it was the training of um, a ResNet 50 model, so a rather standard uh, model uh, when it comes to computer vision tasks. Uh, but the, the training was done on a bigger net, which is a large benchmark data set developed uh, created by uh, Professor Begum Demir at the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, and um, basically it, uh, it contains uh, more than half a million images from Sentinel-2 and now also from Sentinel-1. And the interesting thing is that um, 
this is not a simple problem of having a symbol, a single label uh, associated to each of the images that you're going to, to train a model on and classify, but it actually it's a multi-class problem where each uh, patch can be associated to uh, to more than uh, just one label. Uh, so uh, especially that this was a quite interesting use case for us also because not only that, but there was the other level of complexity that the input data actually, uh, depending on the band, the, um, yeah, not only the spectral characteristics of the signal are different, but also really the spatial resolution of these Sentinel-2 data uh, is uh, different as most of you might know. So the RGB data at 10 meters resolution and then others at 20 and even 60 meters. Um, so that was quite a, an interesting case study for us. And we uh, deployed it on uh, two HPC systems at JSC and basically compared the performances on the K40 GPUs that were the one in orange here in this figure on the Eureka system and uh, on uh, Jewels that back then had the new, uh, the new V100. And basically we were able to scale uh, successfully up to 24 nodes, uh, which means 96 GPUs um, and reduce the time uh, pretty significantly. If you have a look, we managed to, to train uh, the model just for one epoch, uh, it took 15 seconds instead of uh, uh, 172 multiplied by eight. So basically almost yeah, more than 1000 seconds. So that was pretty uh, impressive. Uh, so um, uh, then we, we use this uh, use case to, and we expanded uh, it uh, with more functionalities, let's say. So we started with the with the rest of 50, as I was saying, but then we benchmarked also the performances with newer uh, models like EfficientNet that use that with a, a lesser number of parameters can actually reach uh, even better accuracies. Uh, we also managed to deploy our code on the Jewels booster uh, that uh, Marcel was mentioning that has the new uh, A100 GPUs. Then we also uh, tested newer optimizers. Uh, so some of them that I mentioned like LAMB that I mentioned before. And also uh, our code was profiled uh, in the context of a European project uh, in Aachen and also now adding some more functionalities like elasticity of Orovod in the context of the Admire project. And also on yet another application that is in my opinion, one of the most interesting is that uh, with the help of Marcel, uh, we basically added, um, we, we developed a way of um, uh, doing, of performing the hyperparameter tuning of uh, our uh, model so that uh, we are able to basically, um, to basically find the optimal uh, hyperparameters. And we do so um, using a sort of two levels of parallelism. So, not only using data parallelism to distribute the model, but also parallelizing uh, multiple instances of the models of the training um, to uh, do also the hyperparameter tuning part in parallel. So we have two layers of parallelism here and it's, uh, I think it's something really interesting. And, and we wrote uh, basically together a, a paper, a, journal, a conference paper that was sent to IGAS 2022 and we'll present in July uh, this year. So um, there are some slides that I'd like to go through uh, before concluding my presentation, uh, which uh, mainly, I mean, are, are a way for me to, to sum up a bit what I've been talking about and what I see, what I think might be some of the, of the trends in next, uh, over the next years. Uh, in, when it comes to uh, scaling uh, deep learning models. So as I was saying, we uh, have entered a, a phase of maturity of these, uh, of these uh, algorithms, of these solutions. So there are many approaches available now, many libraries. And so uh, definitely compared to even when I started some three and a half years ago, now the usage of those libraries is uh, much more handy, much more convenient. The APIs are much clearer, well-documented. So uh, I've seen this happening and I think this is going to, to, to go on. 
So we, we are going to see even more, uh, let's say, uh, an establishment also of even more advanced technologies like the one by Deep Speed when it comes to model parallelism. That's very interesting, in my opinion, to enable researchers uh, and allow them uh, to uh, scale even larger models. But also, uh, when it comes to the industry, uh, there is this trend of offering not only, uh, let's say, the cloud and the, let's say, the infrastructure and uh, the, uh, the libraries and environment, but also to really uh, provide new services where you, for example, pay for the data that, you, that your models uh, ingest. Uh, one here, there is just one example, which is this Samba Nova uh, from two years ago now, uh, which was interesting. So a cloud provider, but especially focusing uh, on deep learning, on scaling deep learning applications. Um, and, uh, but yeah, as I was saying, there's a lot going on. Uh, and uh, uh, so as we are enter, we have entered this phase, this new phase of maturity of the technology, other players have entered, have entered the market of uh, GPU devices for scientific applications. So uh, now there is, uh, uh, as I was mentioning, also the intention by, uh, by Intel to enter uh, this market by IBM. And also uh, now it's gaining a lot of space uh, of uh, market share AMD uh, with on the new Lumi and also in Barcelona and also in Oak Ridge, as I was saying, they're really uh, selling a lot their uh, their new GPUs. That's really interesting. So we'll see what will happen also in terms of compatibility uh, of the code uh, regarding the usage of, let's say, different platforms. That's that's going to be very uh, curious also for us researchers, I'd say, to test out our code on different machines and see how it behaves. But uh, as I was saying, the, there has been this trend in recent years to basically also in, in, the, in the market, so in the, for commercial purposes, to sell integrated uh, products like the Sambanova one, um, and because uh, again, these, the, the cloud providers have been offering more and more over time uh, HPC resources, so very powerful resources also on the cloud. So here I extrapolated from the Azure, so the Microsoft cloud service, uh, some pricing, a table with the pricing of their resources, um, basically to see how much renting out a node with GPUs would cost. Um, and uh, so um, I, I also tried to to compute, to see by myself uh, with the reference of this really nice uh, YouTube video by Lex Friedman also anyway, has a really uh, interesting podcast if you're into AI and so on. Uh, and uh, he, he computed, let's say the cost of training this new huge uh, language model like GPT. And you see that actually uh, the cost that, uh, that uh, I mean, one would have, well, this, that companies have to uh, undertake when it comes to training, just one instance of these models is rather high. So, um, so this gives also a, a motivation of uh, for us why for us researchers uh, uh, it makes sense to take the best out of the HPC systems that we can actually access, because actually uh, using cloud resources uh, would be rather uh, most likely unaffordable for most of our research groups unless we work for Microsoft. So um, this is interesting. So again, try to have a look at this video that explains also a bit more of what might be the cost of training uh, the next uh, uh, generation of, uh, of, uh, of models. Again, as I was saying, these are, these are GPT-3s uh, of 2020. Now we have even larger models that are 10 times bigger. So, I mean, you can just imagine how, how much this, this would cost. So um, yeah, the, one of the final slides of my presentation is about this news, uh, yesterday's news actually. Uh, so there was this conference uh, uh, in Hamburg and uh, um, basically they, uh, it's a very important uh, uh, HPC conference that takes place every year. Uh, and uh, every year they issue the top 500 uh, list that is a ranking of the uh, most powerful and fast uh, uh, supercomputer. You, uh, I suggest you to have a look also because um, in recent years, they have been creating newer uh, lists, so newer rankings, not only with the most powerful, but also with the most powerful when it comes to 
uh, being sustainable from uh, the point of view of the uh, impact on the environment, so of the energy efficiency and so on. So uh, I really strongly suggest you to have a look. Um, uh, but the news here is that we officially entered uh, the era of uh, exascale that we've been preparing for a long time now. Uh, so here there is also an article of the New York Times from yesterday uh, that uh, celebrates the news. And this happened in Oak Ridge, so this supercomputer uh, national lab in the US of the Department of Energy. Uh, and the, interestingly enough, this uh, supercomputer is actually adopting AMD GPUs, so also good to know. Uh, I also left the reference uh, of some applications uh, uh, that uh, were, uh, that if you're interested to understand what actually Exascale might enable, um, uh, so uh, actually it's also by Oak Ridge. So uh, if you are uh, actually annoyed by this, so the multiple European flags in my slides, you will see uh, something American, which is also good for you. So a different perspective. Uh, and also, yeah, they report many simulation and deep learning applications that uh, will benefit strongly from the advent of, um, uh, of exascale computing. So Oak, uh, Oak Ridge, this new frontier supercomputer is now top one and it surpassed, surpassed uh, uh, overtook actually Fugaku in uh, Japan uh, with almost double uh, the uh, speed in terms of uh, uh, petaflops of floating point operations per uh, second. So um, yeah, that's really recent news. So also interesting to, to introduce it here. But to sum it up uh, in the end, so what uh, so so as I was saying, technology now most of the libraries are very well established in distributed deep learning, so it's much easier and simpler to adopt them. Even if you just have a couple of GPUs, you, you can try them out, and in general, at some point, uh, after some hours, you should be able to, to train your models in a distributed fashion. So I think it's really interesting. Um, so uh, yeah, as always in the as always in the market. Uh, as it happens always, there, there, we have entered this uh, this phase. There is not anymore the the, the, the frenzy of the early uh, stages, let's say, but it's more the maturity of the, of a of a of a technology. Uh, and uh, so, with all that it uh, entails, obviously. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so what I'd like you to to take away from from this lecture is that actually using so if you have access to to these uh, resources you can actually take advantage from them it's not so complex as it used to be so uh, it's definitely doable and uh, uh, the effort that you put in it can really uh, have a big impact on on your research uh, speed up significantly the training of your models and uh, allow you to uh, reach uh, newer uh, newer achievements uh, in your uh, own research so uh, I'd like to, to conclude thanking uh, all uh, the people that supported me and are supporting me during my PhD, uh, namely one of them being Gabriele Cavallaro here, but also I acknowledge the help uh, of uh, when it comes to preparing the material uh, that was provided by the members of the Helmholtz AI consultant group at JSC that also organizes uh, every year uh, school uh, on uh, scalable uh, deep learning, which is also really uh, interesting. And so I left the link also to that if you're uh, into it. So that said, my time is over, it's fine. And uh, yeah, well, uh, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I'm here, so <laughs> unfortunately I cannot escape. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't be shy. I mean, you can shoot. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> well, this is, uh, the talk was basically also about just deep learning in a sense, and there is also the paradigm of reinforcement learning, I thought of play. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the case of distributed, yeah. do, you, do you know it? Uh, have you heard it about it? So, again, uh, uh, so for the reinforcement learning part, I've heard more of Ray. Ah, Ray, yeah, 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 sure, yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, basically, um, Marcel is going to talk about Ray uh, very soon after my my presentation. So, but yeah, we we actually uh, yeah we 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 have started some time ago to 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 use it as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it completely different from the ones you have selected so far? Or? Not that I know. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. In fact, we also use some of the uh, features of Ray. Uh, okay. Yeah, namely in this case for hyperparameter tuning. Okay. So um, let's see. Wait a second. Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, the last the, the last work that we we are presenting uh, in um, at Tigers this year. Uh, so what Marcel uh, and I did is basically using a double layer of parallelism in a way. So that we do both um, data parallelism with Horobot, and on top uh, we distribute each uh, instance of the training with Horobot, which is already distributed. But we distribute these instances to perform also hyperparameter tuning on top. So it's a sort of two two layers of parallelism in a way. So yeah, we are trying to do that. Okay. Let's say. It's quite interesting, yeah. So. Yeah. When you say hyperparameter tuning, are you using grid search or Bayesian optimization? Or yeah, there, there are multiple, multiple actually uh, optimization um, uh, algorithms that are used. I think that this in this case, Marcel, we use mainly we tried out some of them this, for sure uh, by Asian optimization, right, Marcel? If you can unmute you, maybe. So, so like the I, I will also say a few more words about this this paper in my talk later. C can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, nice. Um, uh, in like in the paper, we just used random search, uh, but I will also give an, an introduction of uh, some other uh, algorithms in my talk. Uh, some other yeah hyperparameter tuning algorithms and also uh, that that includes uh, Bayesian optimization. Thank you, Marcel. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have other <laughs> issues or things, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks to you and Marcel. We see each other in for 30 minutes, I'll ask. 35 minutes, okay. Then see you later, Marcel. Okay. Yeah, so I think most of the people are back. Marcel, the stage is yours. And thanks again for being here. Uh, I think I still need the right to share. Uh -huh. So look. Screen. You should be able. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can see the slides. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, then um, welcome to the last talk today. Um, I will be um, uh, talking today about distributed hyperparameter tuning and um, how we can leverage um, HPC resources to accelerate uh, this process. And for that, we will start out with some motivation. I will explain um, what hyperparameters in uh, machine learning are and why they are important. Then we will look into some efficient methods uh, of doing hyperparameter optimization um, from literature. Uh, after that, I will introduce the Ray Tune library that can be used for uh, efficient hyperparameter optimization, also on uh, HPC systems in a distributed fashion. And um, in the end, I will also present a small um, remote sensing use case application where we used uh, uh, hyperparameter optimization on the big earthnet uh, data set 
And uh, yeah, that's the the paper that uh, Rocco actually already mentioned uh, earlier. So let's start out um, with uh, what hyperparameters are and why they are so important. Um, I probably don't need to tell you that, but uh, the way you usually build uh, machine learning models, model is, uh, or usually looks like that. Um, when 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 you, you, you have the problem you want to solve, you first, uh, as a human, build uh, a model with the experience um, you have from earlier models or from your background as a domain scientist. Then you train your model. Um, in the case of neural networks, for example, with an uh, iterative method, method like uh, uh, gradient descent. Um, so uh, then by, by this loop, you improve not the hyperparameters, but the like the normal parameters, the, uh, the weights and biases of your model. And once that is done, you look at the final performance. And based on this performance, you then uh, will probably, again, improve your model design. Um, maybe you will just need to do some fine tuning to your architecture or to your hyperparameters. Uh, maybe you need to uh, try out uh, a different type of machine learning model, um, but basically, um, from you you learn from your experience. And um, while this progress uh, works and is uh, good in general, because you learn a lot about your models, um, you know how they behave, you know what kind of par hyperparameters are causing problems. Um, but this uh, also requires lots and lots of trial and error, right? Like you need to run things a lot of time and um, look at the the performance you get and then uh, need to adjust things. Uh, and this is especially hard when you have uh, a lot of uh, hyperparameters um, you need to adapt. So the hyperparameters in machine learning models um, in general can be uh, a lot. Uh, because uh, on the one hand, we have these uh, architectural uh, hyperparameters, uh, like what type of machine learning models, the uh, number of layers you want to use, and uh, the kind of layers you want to use, uh, the neurons per layers, what activation functions uh, you want to employ, and of course, also things like uh, white initialization and white uh, regular regularization. And on the other hand, um, we have these uh, classical hyperparameters that are more related to the optimizer, um, which can be the type of optimizer, the batch size, the learning rate, uh, or things like learning rate schedule or momentum. And um, yeah, optimizing the, the first part, these architectural parameters is um, sometimes also referred to as neural architecture search. But general, um, when I say hyperparameter tuning, I'm referring to all of these uh, together. Um, and what's actually uh, sometimes forgotten is also the pre-processing pipeline uh, in machine learning models, um, because this also uh, has hyperparameters that uh, you can tune. And uh, in the case of remote sensing, where there's a lot of uh, image data that involves pre-processing steps like the image size, the image normalization, uh, image cropping, image rotation, uh, or also a number of spectral bands, um, as we heard in the earlier talk, um, to, to include. Um, so you see that uh, there are lots of parameters. And um, what makes this so tricky is that they are a mix of uh, discrete parameters like optimizer type uh, or type of layer and continuous um, variables like uh, the learning rate, for example. Um, and as I already said, um, the, the optimization of this uh, requires lots and lots of trial and error if you do it by hand. Um, so um, the, the question is, if we optimize uh, what I call the inner loop, uh, in in machine learning models, which uh, yeah, going bad would be something like this, um, where the where the 
uh, parameters of the model are adjusted by uh, iterative method methods like um, the the uh, uh, gradient descent. Um, why don't we also optimize the outer loop? So uh, the whole design process of the uh, of your machine learning models. Um, maybe there are better better methods uh, to do this. Um, than just doing it all by hand. And um, this graph shows the uh, importance uh, of uh, hyperparameters. Um, here I was training a simple ResNet on the Cypher 10 data set, just randomly uh, sampling learning rates. And yeah, you see that uh, the uh, you get very different results by very large margins. So from, I don't know, low below 20% uh, percent accuracy, to wide above eighty percent accuracy, um, you yeah uh, you see these results very just by changing uh, the learning rate. And also, what's quite interesting is that um, some models that were found by hyperparameter optimization uh, actually beat the um, their human counterparts that uh, were designed by uh, yeah by by experts. Uh, we have examples of this in computer vision and also in natural language processing. Um, but I have to say these are usually like very, very thin margins. Um, so like small differences in accuracy, but still they are technically speaking uh, better than their the human uh, designed models. So let's move on to uh, efficient uh, hyperparameter optimization methods. Um, first, I need to mention some brief terminology um, that is important uh, to remember. So when I say search space, I mean the uh, hyperparameters we want to optimize and the interval that uh, these are sampled from. When I say configuration, I mean a set of hyperparameters that is sampled from the search space. Uh, a trial is one training run of a configuration. So that means you sample a configuration from your search space, train your model uh, until the end, um, and then look at the performance. That would be one trial. And um, as I already said, inner loop optimization uh, in my case is the adjusting of the uh, parameters of the model. So the whites and biases, uh, for example, via um, SGD. And the outer loop optimization is adjusting the hyperparameters. Uh, of the model, so the number of layers or learning rate and all that stuff. Now, uh, when you think about this, um, the easiest way to do hyperparameter optimization that comes to your mind is probably random search. And uh, what we do in random search is that we just sample uh, configurations from our search space, uh, then train it and look at the performance. Um, you can see it here on the on the left, uh, grid on the right. Uh, grid search is actually similar, uh, just a little more uh, structured than uh, random search. And um, I have to say that although this is like a really, uh, although it sounds really simple, uh, this is surprisingly a very good starting point. So if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and have uh, resources to do this, of course, uh, then uh, go with random search. And uh, interestingly, um, regard with regard to HPC, um, this is uh, embarrassingly parallel. Um, in random search, you can just run all of your trials independent from each other. There's little overhead uh, involved in this. And of course, you also need almost no communication between your trials. You just uh, run like uh, tell it what configuration to run and it runs this configuration. Then at the end, you collect uh, the result and that's it. Um, but of course, this burns lots and lots of resources. Um, just when you think about it, there might be some trials uh, as we saw uh, earlier here um, that you probably, I mean, it's not always not uh, safe to say this, but you maybe could have aborted this trial after 100 epochs and say, okay, yeah, there's nothing more happening here. Um, and instead, when you're using random search, you're just burning uh, compute hours on this. 
so the question is, how can we uh, improve this? And um, there are two general ways to uh, accelerate HPO. Uh, the first one is to choose the configurations you want to evaluate in a smart way. And uh, for example, um, we can do that with uh, Bayesian optimization. It's uh, actually uh, the only optimization type we can use here because our search space is uh, yeah, so, so high dimensional and um, uh, consists of uh, uh, continuous and discrete variables. And um, yeah, you, there's no way to do like a real backpropagation or anything like that. You cannot use a gradient descent here. Um, however, uh, Bayesian optimization is also hard to do in high dimensional search spaces. And it also has a kind of parallelism problem. Um, so when you have your different trials, uh, it might be that some of these finish before other trials because they are faster when they, for example, have a larger batch size. Um, and the question in this case is, uh, do you wait for all trials to finish so you can use the results uh, for your Bayesian optimization step? Or do you just wait for some of these trials to finish? Um, it's not, not really straightforward uh, how to do this. So the second um, possibility to accelerate uh, HPO is to accelerate uh, your single, like each trial. Um, and this can be done, for example, with uh, distributed deep learning that uh, Rocco talked about. So if you run each trial on more GPUs, that it makes sense that it's usually gonna be faster. Um, you can do some uh, early stopping uh, of, of bad trials and, and save the resources on more promising trials. Um, and for HPC, uh, this is very important uh, as well with the smart scheduling uh, of, of the trials. And what smart scheduling means, I will show you now. So um, in this case, smart scheduling and early st stopping means to uh, stop trials that have a bad performance early on and allocate uh, these uh, resources that you free by stopping them to uh, better performing trials. And one way to do this is uh, this um, su successive halving algorithm, also called CHAR. Um, in literature, it has been shown that uh, actually successive thirding is, um, gives a better performance, um, but that's not so important. Um, the way this works is that uh, in the beginning, you sample uh, a number of uh, configurations from your search space. And then uh, at several points in time, you look at uh, these trials and only uh, promote the trials that have a better performance or that are in the top 50% uh, to the next level. So you only um, compute uh, or, or let the trials with good performance run and the others uh, you stop uh, earlier. So then in the end, you will hopefully end up uh, with uh, the best performing trial. Um, however, um, as you can see from this animation, um, the, the question is what's about, uh, what happens with uh, late learners? So what if uh, our loss curve suddenly goes up in the end again, that could uh, happen. And um, also one of the main problem is um, how many trials you sample in the beginning. So the two options you have in this case is that you can either uh, run like with a fixed, let's say with a fixed compute budget, you have a certain uh, amount of GPU hours you can use. Um, does it make sense to run more trials? but uh, for fewer epochs, so for a shorter time, or should you run uh, less uh, trials uh, for a longer time, for, for a longer number of epochs? And this is um, where uh, hyperband uh, helps out. So hyperband um, performs this uh, SHA method with different level or so-called different levels of aggression. And um, what we see in this table are uh, the different budget allocations that Hyperband tries out. 
um, that means uh, the different levels of pruning aggression uh, over time. Uh, which we see on the yeah, x axis here and on the y axis we see the time so um n in these uh, columns describes the number of configurations uh, that are sampled in the beginning and uh, r describes the resources that are uh, allocated to each configuration and um on this bracket on the right you see that uh, for example there are uh, five configurations that are sampled, and each of these configurations is uh, just trained for uh, 81 epoch, which is kind of like random search uh, with no uh, early stopping involved. And then on the left side, uh, you see you have 81 configurations, but you train each one of those only for one epoch. Um, and then uh, you basically uh, kill off the uh, uh, worst performing uh, trials and only keep the top third one. So in your next uh, level, you only have left uh, 27 uh, trials that you train for three more epochs and uh, so on. In the end, uh, you will end up uh, in this case with one a trial that you train for the full uh, 81 epochs. And you see that uh, this uh, hyperband algorithm um, tries out all these different, so uh, S equals four is uh, the most aggressive form of uh, uh, of pruning bad trials and S equals uh, zero is the uh, yeah, least aggressive form of pruning and um, hyperband tries out all these different uh, levels of aggression and um, thus uh, finds uh, the best uh, uh, that or, or in in the end uh, saves uh, compute time uh, by not having to try out uh, uh, so, so so many uh, different configurations. Uh, I'm wondering why. Ah, okay, there it is. Um, uh, but of course, uh, yeah. The, there are some some ways uh, uh, to improve hyperband as well, uh, and the first uh, one is to combine it with Bayesian optimization. So, um, what's what's happening here with these configurations? They are all sampled randomly, so there's uh, no information about prior trials uh, in this. So, when you uh, combine it uh, with Bayesian optimization, um, you will probably get better performance. And uh, the most uh, uh, interesting uh, improvement to hyperband uh, for us HPC users is this Usher algorithm, which is an asynchronous version of uh, uh, hyperband or SHA. Um, uh, I will show you in a second how it works. Um, but uh, for now, I can say that it's uh, very well suited for HPC applications. And uh, as you see from this graph uh, on, again, a benchmark on a Cypher 10 data set, um, it uh, has actually uh, the best performance uh, in terms of finding the uh, best or the, the, the model architecture or the hyperparameters uh, which lead to the lowest test error after uh, a certain time. So the difference between SHA and ASHA is that uh, with the uh, normal SHA algorithm, uh, you need to, so you, you, you run your trials and then to pick the best, uh, the, the top three uh, of those trials, you usually need to wait until all of your older trials uh, have finished. And um, yeah, then you move to the next level and only keep uh, the best, well, the, the top third of those. Um, but as I said, uh, one problem in hyperparameter optimization is that some trials are faster than the others. And to avoid uh, uh, this, some sort of uh, worker idling, um, what Asha does is that it just waits until three trials have finished um, and then promotes the top one of those of those free trials. 
And since you're always promoting uh, the best trials, you are kind of fail safe in that sense that you will never actually uh, toss out uh, a good trial. Uh, it might happen that you will promote uh, a bad trial, um, but that but that's yeah not uh, we we don't worry too much uh, about that. And uh, other options, um, like other general options. Uh, to do hyperparameter optimization include uh, the so-called population-based training, uh, uh, which is, uh, uses uh, this genetic approach. Um, where at the beginning, you sample a lot of um, configurations, then look at their performance, and uh, uh, do a mutation of the best-performing uh, configurations you have, uh, and so on. Um, then we have reinforcement learning, which was actually one of the first approaches uh, in, in literature uh, to do this neural architecture search, uh, where you let an agent uh, select the uh, hyperparameters of your model and then use the uh, accuracy or the, the performance that you got from this architecture as a reward for your reinforcement learning agent. And uh, one very interesting approach is. Uh, this uh, differential architecture search uh, called DART, um, where you actually design a kind of continuous representation uh, of your ser architecture search space um, so that you can actually, in this case, uh, use a gradient descent uh, method for optimization. Uh, and this actually... Uh, I, I think I've read about that. There's uh, this has also been applied uh, to remote sensing, but I uh, don't know uh, about the details in that case. So that's it for a short uh, literature overview. Let's move on to um, HPO on HPC. Um, and as I said, uh, we want to do that with uh, the Ray library, which I will introduce now. So uh, Ray is an uh, open source uh, library maintained by a company called AnyScale. It provides uh, simple primitives uh, to run and build distributed application and um, parallelize uh, your existing uh, code you run on your local laptop machine to a cluster um, with uh, lots and lots of uh, parallel processes with very few code uh, changes. And uh, what's so interesting about it as well is that it uh, works with a lot of different uh, machine learning uh, libraries. So in, in general, uh, Ray itself also has uh, different libraries. Uh, for example, there's uh, Ray SGD uh, for training uh, machine learning models. There's RLib for reinforcement learning. But of course, uh, the most interesting for us is this Raytune library. <clears throat> and uh, Raytune can be configured with uh, very little work to work on all big uh, cloud providers like uh, Amazon or the, the, the Google Cloud. Um, but of course, it also runs on uh, HPC systems uh, via Slurm. And as I said, it also runs on your uh, local machine. So um, for the Raytune library, uh, here the focus is on uh, the distributed hyperparameter tuning. Uh, among the uh, other machine learning libraries it supports, there's PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, MXNet, and also Horvath. So uh, this is what Rocco uh, also mentioned earlier. Um, we can actually run our uh, trials in parallel with Horvath. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, we can run our trials in parallel on the inner loop and with Horovod and run our uh, hyperparameter tuning in a distributed way uh, on the outer loop uh, with uh, Ray Tune. So, for example, um, yeah, in, in Ulich we have uh, four GPUs per node. So in that case, we would uh, would make sense to run. Uh, train one model on those CPUs 
and uh, do HPO on the whole cluster with, for example, uh, 20 nodes. Um, yeah, the other stuff is not so important here. Um, when you look at the workflow, you uh, the, the way you do it in Raytune is that you uh, set up your problem. You then define a, a search or a scheduling algorithm, which are also uh, uh, most of them are integrated in into Raytune. Um, and then you just uh, call uh, tune.run. Um, I will sh also show you an example uh, or a, a code example uh, later how to do this. Um, as I said, Raytune is suitable for distributed uh, HPO. So let's take a look at how it does that. Um, first, you launch uh, your head node. So this is kind of your main worker. Um, then you launch uh, your worker nodes and uh, connect them uh, to the head node. And uh, then the head node will launch um, the different uh, trials uh, you want to compute on your uh, on your worker nodes. Then the worker nodes do their work. They uh, compute the training of the neural networks. Uh, and after some time, uh, still not like before they finish uh, the whole training, uh, they report back uh, a metric like the training accuracy uh, back to the head node. And uh, the head node then runs uh, some kind of uh, yeah, optimization, for example, uh, Bayesian optimization uh, to decide uh, which trials uh, to stop uh, and which trials to continue and where to launch uh, new trials with new configurations. Uh, and actually, I think one of the questions earlier for Rocco was about um, uh, reinforcement learning uh, with Ray, if I uh, remember correctly. Um, and this is actually kind of uh, the same, it works the same structure, uh, just that in this uh, case, um, if you are not doing hyperparameter tuning, um, but if you're doing uh, distributed reinforcement learning, um, the head node in this case would launch uh, different uh, agents, different reinforcement learning agents on all the worker nodes. Okay, uh, as I said, um, integration of Raytune is uh, rather simple. Uh, this is uh, the example of the code that's required to uh, do a simple um, uh, uh, optimization with uh, the Usher uh, scheduler uh, for a, a simple neural network. Um, so I first uh, need to design the search space, which I do with a uh, config dictionary. Um, for example, here I have the number of convolutional layers, batch size, white decay, and learning rate. And I also define which uh, intervals I want that sampled from. Um, then I select a scheduler and uh, the, the corresponding metric uh, I want to look at. Um, then I can... Uh, uh, define how many resources I want to use uh, per trial. So in my case, I'm using uh, nine CPU cores and one uh, full GPU. And I can also set how many samples I want to uh, evaluate. And then in the end, you just uh, call uh, tune run um, and get your result. And uh, yeah, while Ray does uh, its uh, computation, uh, it uh, shows you some output. So during the training, the output looks like this. Um, here you can monitor your results, um, the current status of your trials. Uh, so some are running, some are waiting for resources to free up uh, so that they can run. Uh, some are already terminated. Um, and you can also see which configurations uh, were chosen uh, for, for the trials and uh, what their current uh, accuracy is. So this graph shows uh, uh, an example, uh, actually the, the using the search space or the, the Raytune code I showed you earlier. In action uh, on one of our supercomputers here in Jülich, um, you can see the best performance, the, the 
accuracy of the best performing trial. Um, and you see, yeah, that uh, over time, uh, this basically uh, improves. And what's also uh, interesting to see, um, uh, so this graph shows uh, different trials uh, where the x-axis is the number of epochs and the y-axis is uh, the time that trials run. And what you can uh, see here are the, um, the early stopping mechanisms. So you see that um, not all of these lines go until uh, epoch 300, um, but uh, a lot of them are actually stopped after, yeah, uh, some time and uh, to, to free up resources for these uh, more promising trials. So just to, to do a quick uh, comparison uh, of Ray Tune uh, with other uh, HPO framework, um, I have to say I took this, uh, this table from the Anyscale website. So one should not put too much trust into this. Um, but what we can say for sure is that uh, Ray actually supports integration of lots of other HPO libraries as well. So if you want to use Optuna, uh, you can do that, um, but you can just plug your Optuna uh, library into Raytune because uh, yeah, Optuna, as far as I know, does not natively support uh, distributed tuning. So in this case, you could just use Optuna for the optimization step and let uh, handle uh, let Ray handle uh, the distribution of the trials. And this is what uh, yeah makes it so uh, such a such an interesting library that it can uh, uh, can can integrate all these other libraries while at the same time do these very efficient uh, distributed training for you. Okay, as I uh, promised, uh, the last check section for today will cover the apl application in remote sensing. And um, what I will present now is uh, a method to accelerate uh, the performance of uh, the single trials uh, in hyperparameter optimization. Um, yeah, I, I probably don't need to tell you this, um, but there's lots of raw image data uh, available in, in remote sensing. One example is this big earth net uh, with roughly uh, 600,000 image patches. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a classification model and we want to train uh, uh, machine learning models to, to, to do this classification for us. And um, because as, as Rocco already mentioned, um, this is a very big data set um, and uh, we have uh, HPC resources. So let's use HPC to train classification models and at the same time tune the hyperparameters of our um, uh, machine learning models. So uh, for, for this application, the um, neural network architecture we chose was uh, the efficient net. And um, when, as Rocco already mentioned, when you uh, want to do distributed deep learning uh, on an HPC system, you need uh, a large batch size so that uh, you use your uh, your resources in an efficient efficient way. Uh, larger batch sizes keep your uh, GPUs. Uh, 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 it's so you, you you reach a higher uh, GPU utilization, um, which with a large batch size and this uh, also usually means faster uh, run times. So uh, as uh, investigations by Rocco uh, have shown in the past uh, on, a, on a ResNet 50 is that uh, you get a drop in your uh, validation or also I think also in training uh, accuracy sometimes um, when you use large batch sizes. So these are results from a, a paper from Rocco um, where you got with a, a small batch size, you got an F1 score of 0.78, uh, scaling up the batch size to 8,000, also got an uh, acceptable F1 score. But once you move to batch sizes of 16,000 and larger, um, the training was actually diverging. So the uh, idea was to uh, adapt uh, the batch size of uh, of uh, this this training uh, during the training process. So 
Um, we use a small batch size in the beginning to kind of uh, wait until the training uh, process is stabilized and then use a bigger batch size afterwards um, to foster uh, uh, efficient uh, resource uh, utilization. Um, and yeah, we, we wrote that down in a paper that uh, was accepted at uh, the IGAS conference this year. Um, adapting uh, the batch size uh, during the training process is easier said than done, uh, because generally, uh, especially ten TensorFlow, uh, does not expose the current batch size to the user. Um, so there are two options. Um, if you want to change your batch size uh, during training, uh, the slow one is to train your model with a small batch size, then save all the whites and biases to memory, and then reinitialize your model with your saved whites and biases and the bigger batch, uh, the bigger batch size. Um, but this, of course, uh, takes longer because uh, you have these expensive memory operations. And uh, the faster option, uh, which uh, we luckily got to work, is to initialize uh, the model with a big batch size. And then during the, the training process, uh, split up uh, the, this bigger batch size into smaller batches and then call your um, optimization step on each one of these smaller, uh, each one of these uh, smaller batches uh, separately. Um, so we ran uh, the, the trial with these uh, big earthnet uh, on the Eureka DC uh, supercomputer here in Jülich. Um, for the uh, inner loop uh, optimization, we used uh, data parallel training with Forovod. Um, for nodes uh, that corresponds to 16 GPUs per trial. And um, we used uh, a starting batch size of uh, 32 per GPU. So with 16 uh, GPUs, that means you get an overall global batch size uh, for each trial of uh, 1024. Um, and we increase this local batch size to uh, 512 per GPU. So um, we end up with a global batch size of uh, roughly 16,000 um, in the end. Um, for the hyperparameter tuning, we ran six trials uh, in parallel at the same time with rate tune. So six trials uh, with uh, each trial using 16 GPUs. Uh, that means uh, in total, we used uh, 96 GPUs in parallel. Um, and this, then the nice thing is that this is able, well, we are able to do this um, with the combination of uh, Horovod and uh, rate tune. Um, yeah, the, the hyperparameters we optimized were learning rate, white decay, and momentum, and instead of momentum. And to uh, show that this technique is working, um, in this case, uh, we were actually just using um, random search, so no search or scheduling algorithm uh, to make sure that they these algorithms don't, uh, yeah, uh, uh, like like uh, these algorithms don't um, produce uh, results that we could not um, uh, that results that we could not uh, yeah pin back onto our uh, adaptive batch size process. So looking at the results, um, we uh, achieved a speed up uh, four times speed up um, when changing the batch size compared uh, to using a constant batch size. Um, you can see the point of change uh, here in the graphs, uh, of course. So after 20 epochs, um, uh, we changed the batch size and then the uh, time per epoch is uh, much lower uh, than when uh, when, when training with uh, the smaller constant batch size uh, throughout the whole training. And uh, we choose uh, 20 epochs in this case uh, to give the optimizer enough time um, to kind of settle uh, while uh, on the other uh, remaining 80 epochs uh, uh, leverage uh, the bigger batch size for efficient resource uh, utilization. So 
there was no that like this there was just a rule of thumb uh, in this case to uh, take epoch 20 as a, a point where to change uh, batch sizes um the if one score results uh, show uh actually when you compare uh, the uh, the the trials we ran with the small batch size and the one where we uh, had to switch to the bigger batch size uh, no or only like a very marginal uh, drop in accuracy um, both uh, f1 scores are pretty similar um, what's uh, yeah if, if you remember from the beginning uh, in, in the earlier investigations by Rocco it was the case that um, when using a batch size of 16,000 um, the uh, training would actually diverge so this is uh, not uh, not the case here and um, also uh, this whole hyperparameter optimization process where we ran uh, 24 trials uh, each time um, once with the with the constant batch size one with the changing batch size uh, is or leads to a speed up uh, three times uh, speed up um, so we are much, much faster. Um, uh, we, we can do our hyperparameter optimization much, 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 much faster because our trials uh, are so fast with this um, adaptive batch size trick. Um, yeah, uh, pros and cons of this approach. Um, as we saw, we got a uh, nice speed up, um, no more uh, drop in validation accuracy. Um, with our bigger batch size, we were able to use uh, the HPC resources efficiently. And what's interesting is that there are also uh, some metrics uh, that are backed by, by theory, like the gradient noise scale, um, that actually could help uh, to compute a better um, uh, a, a better uh, batch size uh, adaptation method. So as I said, in our case, we just chose uh, the Epoch 20 as a rule of thumb. But with these metrics, it would be possible to also do a more fine-grained uh, approach or to get a better estimate of at which time in training you should change your batch size. Um, but to mention the limitations, of course, um, we, of course, only tested uh, this uh, one data set, this big earth net. And also, um, it does not uh, address uh, the issue of... Uh, late learners. Uh, so what if you, uh, with your smaller batch size, uh, would have made uh, in the end uh, 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 a huge leap uh, in your training process uh, that we kind of uh, yeah kill off with our large uh, batch size approach. So yeah, this is my last slide. Um, just to summarize uh, what I talked about, um, with distributed HPO, we want to uh, not only optimize uh, the inner loop with uh, data parallel uh, training, but also optimize the outer loop of hyperparameter um, optimization. Uh, we exploit uh, the full level of uh, parallelism um, by using, for example, Horovod in combination with uh, Raytune. Um, as I showed you, the uh, Raytune library is very lightweight uh, and works um, most of the times uh, uh, straightforward on HPC systems. And uh, all these methods I presented could, of course, uh, very easily also be uh, adapted to uh, remote uh, sensing, adapted to remote sensing use cases. Um, that's it from me. Thanks uh, for listening. Um, and yeah, I look forward to uh, any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Marcel. Maybe uh... so. Time for questions, if any. We we can cover this uh, also, you know, the previous talk, and now maybe you have a better overview of these methods. Anything you can, yes? Uh, sorry, um, okay. Exercise. <laughs> uh, 
Hello, so thank you for the talk. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, we should be worried about uh, overfitting uh, when we do the hyperparameter tuning. So maybe we overfit to the validation set. Uh, yeah, that's that's actually uh, a problem, of course. Um, so the way they the researchers usually uh, do that when they run hyperparameter tuning is to have a separate test set um, where you then so you you run the training, um, uh, then pick your best model from the hyperparameter tuning based on uh, the validation set, and then do a final evaluation on a separate test set. Um, but I'm actually not aware of any yeah, scientific like uh, analysis. Uh, if, like if, if people um, have experiences, uh, how much hyperparameter tuning leads to overfitting. Uh, that's but that actually would be interesting to to investigate. Yeah, uh, and the problem is that uh, you may pick the best model for the validation set, but maybe this is not the best for the tests. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, so that's why you why you have uh, the test set uh, to uh, to to do a final check if your model is is really good. Um, and I, I I actually don't don't know about uh, like if this is uh, actually a common problem uh, in in hyperparameter optimization. Or I I haven't read about it. Um, but then again, lots of this uh, research in um, hyperparameter tuning is done on these yeah big vision uh, data sets like cipher 10 or ImageNet. Um, and maybe it's not a problem there, but it uh, for sure could be in uh, yeah kind of real world application cases. And before we go to the next one. I uh, wanted just to add to that one actually. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because normally like from point of view of a, a good experimental design, you should have uh, like inner cross validation and outer uh, outer cross validation. So you split once, train a test set, and then train validation. You do train validation optimization. You test on test set. Then you do a second time. You do the same thing, and then you, you go back to the next test set. And then the problem is is that first it's like scales up the full problem of a uh, parameter optimization because you multiply your time needed for hyperparameter optimization at least by five. And then the issue is if every time model finds different set of hyperparameters, how uh, well it is the final solution eventually. So it's uh, uh, maybe it's all, also a new question, but it's also addition to the previous question. <laughs> so yeah, maybe some thoughts about that from, from, from your Marshall perspective as well. Um, yeah, I've, I've uh, actually, and, and also in, in literature, this is not uh, discussed that much, uh, I have to say, uh, apart from this uh, free, free data set split and train uh, validation and test, uh, I, I haven't actually seen uh, people do this uh, cross validation. Um, but what if every time model will diverge to different site, uh, set of hyperparameters? and a very different set of hyperparameters. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I, I guess the, like the, the only way to, to, in this case, pick a final winner is to yeah, have like one set where you would you complete holdout from one, one, like one split of your data set, which you complete holdout from um all of the other processes and then in the end uh, fit it on on this holdout uh, data set and pick the one that performs best on that one yeah <laughs> but i mean yeah then you need uh, you always could use more data uh, uh, and you, you of course you need to make sure that your your test set is like it's kind of like a good distribution um yeah apart from that i'm i don't see any uh any way to solve this this problem actually uh, excuse me what if people go for scaled cross validation supposedly 
test on small sets, small ports every time. So we can go for 10 for cross validation. Yeah, but you cannot do cross validation while optimizing the hyperparameters because you overfit this way. You always have to have k fold for outer set, then you do k fold within optimization, then you return to the hold out test set you, you test on that because otherwise you, well, if you report actually results of your uh, tuning data set is, is those results are biased so yeah and, and, and this take, uh, like you mean in the optimization we take the k fold b like we take k mean of all the k folds and then optimize on the uh, like the final mean score like instead of just to take like in the, when we decide the hyperparameter set, the optimization set, instead of choosing one specific set for hyper optimization, I know it's the standard procedure and we can use it, but instead of just going for one set, we can go for all the training data that, that, and make it a different course. I think it's uh, like, Suppose we have 80% of the data, so all the 80% we split into four 20% and we test on each of them during the inside the inside loop and during the hyperparameter optimization. And we compute the mean of all the four poles and optimize on the mean of these poles. Uh, and I don't know if you shared that, uh, Marcel. I, I heard uh, part of it. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I mean, as as far as I understood, is uh, that that's also like just some 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 way of splitting your data, right? Um, and into even smaller chunks. Yeah, she's coming I mean, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, I'm going back because I, I'm pretty much covered. Yeah, okay. okay, but you had also one more question. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I think. I okay. Think I'm yeah. okay. So, so uh, just my thought was, I mean, I'm using the same approach as you suggested. Like we, we keep a separate hyperparameter optimization set, like that is validation you call. But instead of that, we can optimize on a k-fold cross validation where we take different splits. And from each split, we take the uh, score and we take the mean of the scores. Suppose uh, we get four scores for, from the splits and we take the mean and then we optimize every time with different parameters on different ports. And you understand that that makes us to check on different uh, types of test sets, not only on one single uh, set, it could be a solution, but it's not uh, computational efficient because every time you do a, each trial, you have to test on four different, maybe uh, it time, maybe take a little more time, but yeah, that's it. That's what I would say. Okay, okay, yeah, so, uh, okay, so uh, I, I, I get, so you said like you want each each trial, you want to train on a different, yes, different. yeah, on a different split of, yeah, okay, I, I got it, yeah, that. I mean, yeah, that's uh, an interesting approach. I, I, I think that should be, uh, yeah, probably the safest way to avoid uh, overfitting. Um, but yeah, then you, as, as you said, you would already add um, even more uh, yeah. computational cost to your already high hyperparameter optimization cost. Yes. Yeah. Maybe there's one more question. How to, uh, like, what would be, be your suggestion to do this hyperparameter tuning, but having in mind some interpretability of the, of the things, actually? Because when I, I was trying to do uh, genetic algorithms for model optimization, sometimes it, it does something, so, but when you check the uh, yeah even Shapley values, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. And so you understand that it doesn't make any sense, but it still goes into like better performance. And is there it's like a problem of matrices I'm using, or is uh, is there a way to, to deal with that? I, so I'm not sure whether it makes sense. 
So you, you are referring to the like kind of importance of your hyperparameters, how you can derive that from the hyperparameter tuning. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess you, in that case, you would need to do some kind of regression analysis. Uh, uh, maybe, I mean, how to, uh, yeah, what would be the strategy to limit the search space to make it more interpretable or you not? Interpret the hyperparameters or interpret uh, the input variables? What? Inter like final features, for example, or yeah. Oh, okay, it's, it's probably I have to think about this question more. So. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I think he was confused. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. yeah, I, I mean, the so uh, that's actually like interpreting the results you get from um, your, your hyperparameter optimization is indeed uh, a thing where people look into. Um, and uh, when you, yeah, this is the output you get from Raytune. So you can like the, Simple way you can do is just yeah sort this column when you're interested in the validation accuracy you just sort this column and then you see and take a look at it but yeah again that's just with uh, you you just look by your uh, with your eyes and see uh, if if there's anything uh, you you can directly spot um, uh, but uh, in 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 terms of uh, doing an actual uh, analysis of which hyperparameters are good and which are not. Um, I also don't think that there's a, a, or not yet a, a good way to do this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually I encourage you to continue this conversation in the Slack channel because you know the Slack channel will be open moms after the school so you know if you want to keep in contact there you know we can even open dedicated channels maybe on hyperparameter tuning so we can just you know keep uh, talking about it maybe you know some one of you find a solution or you know a different approach i think that would be the best way also to continue this you know interaction between each other question small question okay <laughs> yes Yeah, it's a hot topic, I must say. <laughs> uh, just a small question about uh, in this work, it's um, uh, we, we, we you, you study the competition competition time when you increase the batch size to to minimize the competition time. But what about the training stability and uh, and even the accuracy? There are a lot of applications then when we increase the batch style, we are uh, decreasing the accuracy. So what about we can uh, apply an adaptive batch size, but in both directions. We can increase the batch size, but we can decrease the batch size according to not just the F1 uh, score, but also to the training stability on the and the um, com uh, computation time, training stability, and accuracy. So three variables. We can change the value of the batch size in both directions, and we monitor these three variables. Uh, how, how would you define a training stability? Or how, how would you measure it? What you say? Yeah. Uh, when we monitor the uh, the evolution of epoch after epoch, we can use the curve of the accuracy. Ah, and okay. To monitor exactly the the um, how much this uh, model, um, how much the model accuracy in, increased with with the evolution of the epoch. I mean, to uh, to ensure a um, a, um, a reliable model. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so uh, of, I, I think that actually would make sense uh, to, to, to do this for these uh, three parameters uh, in both directions. Um, the, the reason why we, we choose to go just with uh, increasing batch size was to have this efficient resource utilization. So when you have your distributed, do your distributed deep learning, you usually don't 
yeah, you you don't gain anything from a smaller batch size. Um, then you could just run it on a fewer GPUs. Um, but yeah, I I think it should be possible to uh, to to also decrease uh, the batch size um, to uh, Im improve uh, these other um, metrics you were talking about. And actually, this paper uh, I'm just looking if I can find it, uh, where they talk about gradient noise scale. Um, this is actually, uh, yeah, where they, I think, uh, are doing that. Um, so they are adaptively increasing and decreasing uh, uh, the batch size. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, any more questions? Okay, then thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Marcel, for being here and see you next week in Iceland, actually. <laughs> thanks for having me, yeah. <laughs> see you. See you next Bye. week. Thanks again. <laughs>